Hello, I'm Carter, and this podcast broke the internet. I'm Sean, and this week, podcasts are breaking the internet. This podcast? No. Other podcasts. This pod... Oh, shoot. Well, here we go again. It's just like, it's, 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 oh man, it's recursion, it's, it's everything. It's like, maybe we shouldn't even talk about it. Maybe this is like a, a, like a paradox. Maybe we're spiraling around a a black hole right now. Maybe, maybe, you know, it's, it's like, this sentence is false, you know. This pen is blue. (laughs) This This pen is blue? That's a liar, liar reference. Ah. Um, I do it right over my head. <laughs> um, well, uh, Sean and I were looking back on our uh, back catalog of podcasts that we've recorded, which is no longer available. So don't. Which look is no it. longer available. So don't look. Um, but uh, vintage I believe, is what they call it. Mm-hmm, yeah, that's what the kids call it. Uh, I believe that in the course of our podcasting history, we've recorded probably eighty podcasts. In all of that time. In all of our history, we have never talked about podcasts as a topic. We've never specifically focused on podcasts. We really felt like we needed to record 200 hours of podcasts before we felt that we were competent to speak. And now about. we are experts and we can testify. I mean, we feel like fine, like talking about, you know, literature and movies, like whatever. But Elevator we, logic. Yeah. But, uh, you know, podcasts, we wanted to be on a very firm ground. Um. So podcasts, unsurprisingly, I guess, podcasts are very important, at least, you know, to me. Uh, and I, I believe, Sean, they're, they form an important part of, of your life, but you, you you don't always get the opportunity to listen to them as much as you would like. Yeah, I, I don't have... Um, I, I basically listen in my car, which I don't spend that much time in my car, and definitely not anymore. I, I used to have a much longer commute to work. When I first got into podcasts, it's when I had a almost 30 minute commute to work. So basically I could knock out a podcast every time I walk, I went to work because it was usually about an hour. And, um, the first podcast I was listening to were this American life, which was a radio show long before it was a podcast. Mm -hmm. And, um, the Smodcast with Kevin Smith and Scott Mosier, which I didn't even get into because it was a podcast. I got into it because I really liked Kevin Smith. Right. And so that just naturally followed. And now he, that's what he does as as a lifestyle and for all of his income. That is that completely supports him and his family. Yeah. Uh I started listening to podcasts in uh late two thousand eight. Uh and it's when I started working in a library. And I worked in technical services, which means I didn't have to like talk to people. I just you know applied the Dewey Decimal labels to books and stamped them and put them into the system. And it was very repetitive work. Uh, and it it could seem soul-crushing in some ways because no matter how much you did in any one day, there was always more. There was always more to do. Uh, so you never really felt like you were accomplishing anything in some ways. So it was somewhat boring work that was quiet. So it was perfect to like have a podcast on in the background. Right. Uh, I obvious also obviously started listening to this American life that led me to radio lab, which is one of my favorite podcasts uh, and also uh, planet money and the history of Rome podcast. And uh, it also began my obsession of when I find a new podcast, I and I like it, I will like go back all the way to the end or all the way to the beginning and listen to every single one of them until I'm caught up to curse. Isn't that the worst curse? <sighs> I've got three that I'm doing right now. And one of them is just really dumb, but I wanted to do it as a, like a historical and socio- sociological project. I'm listening to the back catalog of planet money, just like slowly. And it's a fascinating, it's fascinating to just like hear about like, Oh, and here's, the 2010 elections and you know here's when you know this happened but i don't happened. i don't think that's that I, you can like just studying history even if it is like the history of the moment can give you so much perspective on the present oh definitely i ended up 
kind of dropping off on my listening of podcasts for a while. I kind of pared down dramatically until I was basically only listening to This American Life and a few others uh, until somewhat recently in the past like year or year and a half after I kind of stopped doing campaigns and have settled down a little more, I've been able to listen to podcasts more. And I have a really long commute. I have a 50 to an hour long commute one way. So I can like bang out a lot of podcasts. So I've had a lot of room to uh, add to my catalog. I, I pulled out my podcast app on my phone. I'm currently subscribed to 23 podcasts. That is madness. It is madness. Uh, they don't all update every week. I don't think I've even listened to 23 podcasts total uh, in yeah. my life. <laughs> well, you know, it's an obsession. What can I say? I, uh, I, I have will no say I, I spend so much time listening to music while doing activities like... If I'm painting, my dad would play music. Like when we were working, like that was the thing to do. And I've slowly transitioned be- to listening to podcasts because I feel like I am accomplishing two things at once. Yes. I find time to listen to podcasts anywhere I can. Like if I'm going to go down to the corner market, which is like three blocks away, I will throw on a podcast. Yeah, I have... Um, I have- I have an Android device, so I have widgets on my like screens, mm-hmm. and I use Spotify for any music that I'm listening to, and I use Google Music to listen to my podcast because it will always save my place. Mm-hmm. So all because I don't have the iTunes, I don't have a, a Apple device, so I just have this widget that is right now paused on an episode of Comedy Death Ray, episode ninety three. And all, I know that all I have to do is press the play button and it picks up exactly where I was and then I'll pause it and then I'll go about my day. And then the next day I get in my car and I hit the play button and I listen to 10 more minutes or whatever yep. it takes me to get to work. Well, you want to talk about insanity? So there is a way that I manage listening to 23 podcasts. So I don't listen. I don't use the Apple podcast app. Uh, it's garbage. Um, I use an app called Downcast. And I, I, it, it allows you to do playlists, and you, you, and it, it's a very, very fully featured app. Uh, I have, a, I have a master playlist of all of the podcasts that I'm listening to, and Downcast has this feature where you can assign every podcast a priority from one to ten, and it uses that priority to sort the playlist. So when the new weekly podcasts that I want to listen to come out, they get sorted to the top regardless of like their date. So I'm always listening to those and working my way through. But then my back catalog and my sort of lower priority podcasts have a lower priority number. So they're in the middle. And as I run out of all of the newest weekly podcasts, then I get thrown down into, like, I'm on my Blueprint for Armageddon 2, this three and a half hour podcast about World War II from Hardcore History that I wouldn't want at the top of my list, even if it came out ahead of some other, you know, some other podcasts. That so. actually sounds amazing. I want that. See, I see if it's on the uh, Google Play Store. I, 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 I doubt. I don't think it is, but it was well worth what like the three dollars I paid for it, and it it gives me that kind of fine grained control. And also, it 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 like every podcast has like nice fine grained settings. So most of the podcasts, it'll download the newest one, put it in the playlist, I'll listen to it, and it goes away. But like our podcasts, I, I want it to keep it there because I'll probably go back and listen to it again or I'll like listen to a certain part of it until I'm like, okay, and then I'll just get rid of it on my own. And then there are all, uh, some podcasts that I never wanted to delete the episode um, because I want to keep them. Uh, like This American Life, I keep all of them because... For that time that you want to hear about, you know, pig bung again. Exactly. I love that episode. They, they uh, have, Did they replay that one recently? I feel like they did. I don't know. I, I It's just one of the best episodes I've ever heard. It's the one that I have told the most people about, I think. Yeah, it's pork, like that. Pork bung. Doppelgangers. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't just Google pork bung. But, uh, <laughs> Google This American Life doppelgangers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> A podcast that I've gotten into in the past six months uh, that is um, that it's only been around since June 2012. It hasn't been around for very long. Um, it's called Welcome to Night Vale. And Sean, you have not heard of this before. Right? No, but it sounds like uh, something out of like World of Warcraft or something. 
out of World of Warcraft? <laughs> oh, Night Vale? That kind of, maybe that does sort of sound like, you know, whatever Blood Gulch or whatever the stuff in World of Warcraft is. I never Blood played. Blood Gulch is Halo. I didn't play Halo. That's hilarious. Blood Gulch sounds like something that would be out of World of Warcraft. Come on. But anyway, Welcome to Night Vale is not like nothing out of World of Warcraft. Um, it is, uh, uh, it's a podcast that is, it, it, it's fiction presented as a community radio show. Okay. Um, it's every, so they publish on the 1st and the 15th of every month, uh, a new piece of fiction. Uh, the producers are Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner, and they write all the episodes and they are narrated or told by Cecil Baldwin, who plays a character called Cecil, who is the radio presenter of this community radio show for Night Vale, which is a fictional town in the southwest United States in the desert. And what I've described it as, it's sort of like public radio show meets uh, Twin Peaks. Okay. Um, so the so Joseph Fink said that when they were coming up with the idea for the series, they wanted to come up with the, the idea was it's a town in the desert where all of the weird conspiracy theories that you've heard of are real. And it's just taken for granted that everything crazy is true there. And everyone in the town is aware of all of them and they just live their lives that way. So like um, uh, there are these tall masked black robed figures that enforce stuff in the town and everyone's like, oh yeah, the masked figures are like, there's a dog park that no one's allowed to talk about. The city council announces the opening of a new dog park at the corner of Earl and Somerset near the Ralphs. They would like to remind everyone that dogs are not allowed in the dog park. People are not allowed in the dog park. It is possible you will see hooded figures in the dog park. Do not approach them. Do not approach the dog park. The fence is electrified and highly dangerous. Try not to look at the dog park, and especially do not look for any period of time at the hooded figures. The dog park will not harm you. There are, like, uh, farmers who farm these crops that are invisible. Uh... <laughs> Um, these invisible oranges that are a staple product of theirs. Uh, and um, This sounds like it could have easily inspired my Minecraft videos. Right. Uh, the, the old wo- there's old woman Josie who is friends with a bunch of angels. Please do not speak to or acknowledge any angels that you may come across while shopping at the Ralph's or at the Desert Flower Bowling Alley and Arcade Fun Complex. They only tell lies and do not exist. And uh, the city council kind of rules the town with an iron fist. And they, uh, they like, really hate their, like, na- their neighboring town. Um, I can't think of the name of the neighboring town, but it's sort of like a, a Pawnee Eagleton kind right, of Right, I was going to say Eagleton. <laughs> yeah, and they actually do a crossover episode where uh, they, um, there's, like, a vortex that joins the two towns together. Uh, and there is a whole podcast that is a totally new dude who's not Cecil who um, records an entire episode, but from that town. So. so it's like the 30 Rock episode that's just the reality show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's called Desert Bluffs. They hate Desert Bluffs. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Boy Scouts have like all these different levels above like Eagle Scout. It's like Blood Scout and Eternal Scout and Timeless Scout. Um, How does that even come up? Uh, because they have graduation or whatever, and it's a town <laughs> thing. They have like the community calendar, and uh, one of the uh, one of the early community community calendars. One of the things that just like I loved about the show and helped draw me in was they were going through the community calendar, and like Tuesday is bingo night at whatever, and then they, they you know Cecil's going through the week, and it's like Friday is canceled this week. <laughs> um, and then one of the uh, so. One of the staples of the of the show is that they always have the weather, and the weather isn't a weather report, but it is a p- a new uh, a piece of new independent music that they showcase in every one of the episodes. 
um, and they've had real, some like real music, real music okay. uh, that they have they have a call for uh, that's constantly going on, and they they pick some like new independent artist who is sort of like fairly unknown that you know they like their style. Um, and I mean, it's like all over the place. They've had like rock music and um, like uh, uh, some like Brazilian stuff and like all sorts of different types of uh, from music all, all over the world. Uh, and that's the weather. That's kind of like one of their little one of the things that they do. Okay. Uh, and we kind of follow the life of Cecil. Uh, he, you know, has a, a love life that comes up in the. Uh, you know, during the course of the podcast and, you know, we follow him in the town um, and just sort of like the weird things that happen in Night Vale. And one of the reasons why I just love it is that it's playing, it's using the podcast format, but in a way that is very different from a lot of podcasts. Yeah, I, I was thinking like, are there other podcasts like this? I don't think there are a lot of podcasts that are like this. I know that there are there are podcasts that are fiction but it is not a very broad category. I, I feel like the reason that podcasts are really attractive to a lot of the people who are involved with them, is like if like Ricky Gervais or Kevin Smith, is because it's almost too easy for them to mm -hmm. sit down and record funny conversation. Yeah. Like they are naturally funny. They are comedy writers. They're just, uh, it's really easy to capture natural life happening and it doesn't require that much effort this sounds like a lot of work it is a huge amount of work uh they've had so um they have to write a new episode every two weeks record it they have so they have this band uh disparition does all original music for their podcasts each week um i think that they reuse a lot of cues but they do score every episode as well okay um outside of the weather uh and more and more often they're having guest people be characters so oh oh another one of the tropes of it is that they have all these this has kind of died down <laughs> you'll get why that's funny in a second in re, in re, like the past like five or six months but for the first like year of the the episode they would have an intern who who will die in the line of duty <laughs> and they end the episode like you know the spinal our, tap our, drummer mm -hmm, yeah exactly like this spinal trap drummer we sent our intern chad to try buying a tennis racket and have not heard back from him for several weeks. This brings me to a related point. To the parents of Chad, the intern, we regret to inform you that your son was lost in the line of community radio duty and that he will be missed and never forgotten. Uh, but now they have, they've had intern Dana who's stuck in the dog park and she can't get out of the dog park. It's like infinite in, in there. <laughs> Um, and there's a it's, mountain. It's floor 19 from the wayside school. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, it's infinite, and there's a mountain in it, and uh, there, there's this, there's this idea in the community that mountains aren't real. So she's having a really tough time, like, like being in the presence of a mountain when all of her school taught her that mountains don't exist, um, and she has to climb it. Uh, it's just. A, it's. I'm getting it's really a, worried that now I'm going to have to listen to this whole show. You might want to listen to the first episode just uh, just to see. Just to see. There's only 42 episodes. Okay, that's not bad. And they, they're only between 15 and 20 minutes. But obviously, because they can't do like oh, a that sprawling. That would be easy. Yeah, I you did it. You picked a good one. Yeah, they, you can catch up on it very quickly. Uh, it, has a, it has a very devoted fan base on the internet. So if you do get into it, there's like lots of cool stuff that you can get into. They've got like um, stickers and t-shirts and all sorts of stuff like that. And... They have gone on several tours, and I mentioned this to Sean off air previously, but I am actually seeing a live recording of a brand new episode uh, this Wednesday at the Lincoln Theater here in good old Washington, D.C. So, so when they do a live recording, do they try to disguise the fact that they're on a live tour going around the country? Um, so I believe that – so the way that every episode is structured is that Joseph Fink introduced the episode as a, as Joseph Fink. Like, I'm the I'm the creator of – Welcome to Night Vale, um, you know, and then he talks about like, hey, you can do this stuff on on our website, and you can do whatever, and then it's like, okay, and here's the show, and mm -hmm. then C Cecil starts out basically the same way every time, and then you know, like, this is the show. So I have a feeling it'll be like, yeah, this is a live tour, this is a new story, um, and they'll go to the show. Okay, 
Um, it's uh, it's going to be with Cecil, um, his boyfriend, Carlos. That's the love interest thing that happens. And I believe uh, a female character that my, uh, I'm not sure if it's a new character or one of my favorite characters, uh, the faceless woman who lives in your house. <laughs> I ho- I'm hoping it's her because she's also running for town mayor. Um, I would really like to see her, especially because she has no face. So I'd like to see her face. Um, and there's going to be original music, but they haven't revealed who uh, who the original music is going to be. And Dispersion will be there scoring as they t- as they perform the episode. Wow, that that is amazing. I'm check it out. I'm really excited to listen to that now. Uh, I will. I will. I will. I will say if you like the first one you should listen to the second one immediately after because the weather in the second episode is one of my favorite songs that i've heard in like a while it's like an it's an awesome song awesome the podcast that i am going to ruminate on it's kind of the reason that carter and i are even recording right now because i fell off of the public I fell out of the public eye for a little while by my own volition and uh, when I started listening to this podcast again it got me so motivated to start doing this again so we can thank Scott Ackerman and the podcast Comedy Bang Bang for making this happen thank you guys yeah I was on Netflix one day and they had just added this uh, the first season of a show on IFC called Comedy Bang Bang and it's a half hour talk show spoof featuring Scott Ackerman as the host and also band leader Reggie Watts. Reggie Watts is actually probably way more famous than Scott Ackerman at this point. He shows up in a lot of commercials. He does theme songs for a lot of different uh, things, especially on Comedy Central. If you ever watched uh, Key and Peel, he does the theme song for that show. Scott Ackerman is uh, 43 years old. He's He came up on the HBO show Mr. Show with Bob and David. He was one of the writers after the third season, I believe. God, what a great show, and it spawned so many people. That's exactly why he's where he is now, because that was after the 80s... I'm going to go like way back. After the 80s boom <laughs> of stand-up comedy, that whole thing kind of collapsed, because you can only have so much stand-up comedy. Yeah, you, Not everyone can be a stand-up comic, or if they are, it just muddies the whole field. And Scott was never a stand-up comic at that time, but a lot of his friends were. And he was always he was writing at the time, and he was one of the instrumental people in the Upright Citizens Brigade, mm-hmm. which is an improv theater. They have several different ones, including in New York and in uh, Hollywood. Uh, it was founded by Matt Besser, Amy Poehler, Ian Roberts, and Matt Walsh. All four of those people have appeared regularly on Comedy Bang Bang. And uh, Scott is one of the things that links a lot of the different comic actors in Hollywood, even though you've probably never heard his name. He uh, was instrumental in the founding of Funny or Die, the website that features a lot of celebrities doing small, like just little comedy bits. Funny or Die was the first website where I ever saw the comic Louis C.K. I had no idea who he was before I saw a two-minute bit on Funny or Die. <laughs> so um, in like 2009, 2010, Scott launched this podcast, Comedy Bang Bang, which was based on a live show he did at the UCB Theater every week, which he still continues to do. And the basic idea of the show is that he is just Scott Ackerman. He plays himself although occasionally there are bits of fiction thrown in um on the tv show he he constantly refers to his wife mavis he doesn't have a wife named mavis (laughs) on the on the podcast he does talk about his real wife and it's probably because at this point she also has her own podcast also on the network which he founded um but he will have a bunch of people on he has uh, Zach Galifianakis, um, Aziz Ansari, Adam Scott, Patton Oswald, Michael Sarah, and all of these people are themselves. But then he will also have, from his experience at the UCB Theater, a lot of other people who will often play characters, either real people or just completely made up people. 
Um, the people that play the most characters are probably Paul F. Tompkins, Thomas Lennon, um, James Adomian, and Andrew Daly. Oh, the other the other guy who does a lot of characters who basically uh, spun it off and made it into his own show is Nick Kroll. Nick Kroll now has his own show on... Oh, Nick Kroll has his own show on Comedy Central. And at least half of the characters that he does on that show are from UCB and Comedy Death Ray and Comedy Bang Bang. Death Ray huh. was the original title. They've changed it since. Um, yeah, they all started on on Scott's show, and now, he, now he's got his own sketch show on Comedy Central using all of those characters. <laughs> he's, got, he's, got, he's got the... Like... Quite the incubator with yeah. comedy yes, bang bang. I, it's the new. He's the new. It goes uh, back to David Cross and Bob. Odenberg. Exactly. I mean, he was right there from the start. It yeah. seems like he cultivates that kind of uh, intellect and improv and people who are naturally funny. So this is Comedy Death Ray Radio. I'm your host Scott Ackerman. We're here with Michael Ian Black, and uh, we're we're gonna. Scott. Uh, uh, oh. Is this a convenient time for me to come in? Uh, oh boy. Uh, sorry about this, Michael. Who is this? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, come on in, Bob. Could, have Hello. a seat. Shut that door behind you, could you? Huh? Just shut the door behind you. Which one? The the only door. As it's gone on and on and on, he's established basically a canon for all of these fictional or real but spoofed characters. <laughs> and he ends up in so deep in these bits that the guest stars who often don't really know the entire history of the show are so confused about what's going on and they will actually start asking like i don't understand if this is a bit right now are we in a bit what is happening (laughs) that's incredible there was one episode where he accidentally said that the year was 2010 instead of 2011 and because improv is all about yes and instead of but no yeah I think Doug. I think Doug Benson was on this episode. Doug Benson was like, "Yeah, we're recording this episode a year in the, in a year before we're, we're going to post it." They ran with that for the entire hour and a half that they recorded. That it was actually that they were recording it in 2010, and they started making all these predictions of things that had already happened. And like uh, they talked about the the time travel machine that he has, and it just. You can tell that they're making it up as they go. This is not Welcome to Night Vale. They did not plan any of this ahead of time. And it always works. There, there's one episode that they fall, in the last five minutes, they fall into a some kind of like black hole. And all of all four characters who are involved, involved in the episode silently work out that this is how the podcast is going to end. And they all fall into the black hole. <laughs> it's amazing to listen to some of these people who are just great improv artists uh making up sketches live right in front of you and that's why it's been such such a successful show at the upright citizens brigade theaters of course and uh i got the opportunity to see the show live recorded last year in dc i saw carter on the way and uh i saw it with the guests uh paul f tompkins who was playing gary marshall of Happy Days and Mork and Mindy fame. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I also saw James Adomian, who was playing f- <laughs> Paul fucking Giamatti, <laughs> who's a very, very angry person on Comedy Bang Bang. Very angry that he's overshadowed by every other schlubby actor in the industry. Uh, and he doesn't get recognized for his work, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a great show to see live. The The energy in the room was amazing and uh the there are not that many things that cross over from episode to episode basically each time they do an episode he introduces a quote new feature and then he never does it again (laughs) and they do that on the tv show as well so it's always like and now it's time for our most popular feature and then he does something and then you never see it again Uh, but the one thing that he does do every time and well maybe not every time but almost every time uh it's become such a fixture of the show that this is probably what the show is known for is he plays a game called would you rather all right so here we go Uh, this comes to us from aritek aritek i believe would you rather own a magical penny or have a nose that was able to lift off like a jetpack after every sneeze the point of the exercise is not to answer that question 
the point is to ask as many questions about the scenarios for Scott to give you more and more information on. And again, since it's always yes and, if you ask the question like, when I sneeze and this nose lifts off like a jetpack, <laughs> does my nose <laughs> detach itself from my face? Scott is going to come up with an answer for that. And the games get so ridiculous and out of hand that you eventually forget what the question even was. <laughs> um, do, the, do the people who are participating, do they ever like... Do they ever like break and laugh and stuff, or do they edit around that, or do they always just take it like it's a game? They, he he basically will override what they're like if they try and break out of it. He will try and control the situation. I don't I don't think I've ever detected any amount of editing. Even if he jokes that they need to edit something, they, you still hear it. Right. He leaves in the part that he says that they were going to edit. So I don't really think that they do. But now when I sneeze, does my nose go into position and then I'm able to straddle it and take off? Yes, basically you go, achoo, and then you hear, and your nose like slides forward. And then you hear lift off imminent in five, four, three, nose, one. And then you, you know by that. <laughs> This is, this is every time I yes. sneeze. Every single time you sneeze. Is it possible to sneeze in this scenario twice in a row? Like <laughs> oh, you don't do. want to do that. You don't want to do that. I don't I want just, to. No, you but don't I want have to do no that. control oh, over no, it. Oh, no, 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 no. Dame Sarah LW, it's please not, don't ask any questions about that. No, please don't. This is unprecedented. No, please. You don't, you don't want to do that. Unprecedented in the world of would you rather. No, no, Dame Sarah LW, please. Don't ask me any questions I about shan't. sneezing twice in a row I, because I that is far too dangerous. I shan't. Just know you sneeze once, your nose detaches from your face, you hear that countdown that we all know so well uh lift off imminent in five four three, three nose, nose one, one. <laughs> and then <laughs> you straddled it by then hopefully and you take off into the wild blue yonder so did, did you get a different experience seeing it live yeah um mostly because he kind of he came out before the recording started and it was almost like when i saw the daily show recorded when you when you go to see a late night show the host will come out before the recording starts and as is the case with the daily show uh john stewart always takes questions from the audience and stuff and kind of like you said with the night veil thing addresses the fact that it is a show that you're about to see or hear recorded and scott came out and kind of talked about like uh specifically he wanted to tell us as a technical note that uh we needed to cheer and or applaud the whole way through the theme song as it played he was like I, I told the audience at the first couple shows that they had to applaud through the theme song, and I don't think a lot of them realized how long the theme song is. And it's not actually that long, but after a while, you feel like you've been clapping and people tend to stop. You can't stop until it's over. <laughs> <laughs> but then um, he kind of did almost the mo it's the most stand up that I've ever that I think he's ever done, which is why he doesn't do stand up. But he kind of walked around and talked about how the tour was going. Um, they had added a later show to uh, the nine thirty club date, so he kept teasing the fact that the late show was going to be the better show and <laughs> that we were all missing out. And he's like, uh, "Okay, so." Get ready. I need you to put your hands together and give a big welcome to Louis C.K. And everyone goes crazy. And then when it starts to die, die down, he's like, and that's what I'll say at the late show. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then once he was done with all of the, you know, the foreplay, uh, he brought out his uh, stools and they all sat down and they recorded probably pretty much the same way that they would have in the studio. Because up to that point, he was walking around holding a mic, but... He wanted to record it, record it, and for that, you can't really be moving around right. a lot on the stage. It's, it's, it's like us that we both picked podcasts that are not exactly like all other podcasts. Right. I think that's why I bought into Comedy Bang Bang so quickly, because it wasn't like the Ricky Gervais show or like Smodcast. It's it blurs that line between reality and fiction it's all it's you know at injecting fiction into podcasts either you know to a great degree like 
like with Night Vale, or just like having a fun fictional element like Comedy Bang Bang that like makes it more fun, loosens things up, and kind of takes the format but subverts it a little bit. Like yeah. that's obviously going to be way, way more interesting than, um, you know, the same things that everybody hears all the time. This podcast, Broke the Internet, is a production of five things. If you have comments or feedback, you can find us on Twitter at PodcastBroke or use the hashtag PodcastBroke. My name is Sean, and this podcast broke the internet. My name is Carter, and this week mobile apps are breaking the internet. This week, I'm going to talk about a couple apps that I use in my daily lifestyle, and one that I'm trying to add to my lifestyle, and then Carter will follow up with some of his own. My first app is Timely. Is that, um, without the appropriate uh, vowels like all the apps are these days? Um, no, it has all of them. Oh, really? Interesting. I was was just trying to... Good for Timely. I guess I was just trying to play on the, uh, the title. At, Tell us, well, that that's that that is that is that's something. Tell us about it, Sean. Timely is a alarm clock and stopwatch and clock replacement tool, and uh, I remember from the brief time that I spent with an iPhone that I hated the uh, the default clock app. It just didn't. There wasn't any real customization options. Has that changed at all? Nope. Okay, so like no like change in the snooze function or. Nope. It's yeah. uh you there there are new iOS seven brought a, a slew of new sounds that can violently wake you up out of sleep. Okay. Uh which are fine. I don't use any of them. I use a song and uh it's still a nine minute snooze and you can't change the length of the snooze, which I find very annoying. Well at least it's nine minutes and not five. Yeah. It's supposed to be nine minutes. Anyway, Timely is a free app that is available cross platform and uh it has every single customization option that I think you could imagine for a clock. One of the cool things that it does is it's cross-platform and it syncs to your account. So you can have it installed on multiple devices and your alarms will go off on all of your devices at the same time. Can't do that with the normal app. Uh, other functions include uh, that it fades in an alarm. I don't have the default app does not have anything like that. Uh, so I wake up to a 30-second fading in alarm, which is much, much less dramatic than the alarm that Quinn wakes up to every day that, if I'm still in bed, scares the crap out of me. Is it is it like a like a klaxon? It's a like UFO sound. She says it's the only one that can wake her up. It definitely wakes me up. Hmm. It's like a theremin. <laughs> do, do, do. That is about it. That's it. Interesting. Um, uh, what do you have to wake you up? What what plays in over thirty seconds? It's a it's a little song. It's just a melody. It sounds like uh, kind of like a melodica, like a xylophony kind of thing. Uh, is it something that's like built into the application, or yes, is it part? Of- it, it came with its own set of tones, and you can use anything that's on your phone. So if I wanted to use a song, I could use a song. Um, it's also got, uh, because my alarm time changes a lot of days, I don't work the same time every day. Some days I don't work. Uh, it's got a really easy way to set the alarm. Uh, I'm going to describe it, but really you should go find a video or something so that you can see exactly what you do. You, uh, basically open the app and you see your alarm that you've used in the past. Right now mine says 5 AM and it's turned off. It uh, turns off every day, but you can change that. So what I do is I hit the little off slider, and it changes it to on. And then I grab the thing that says 5 5 a.m. And then it changes the whole screen to be a 12 to 12 graduated line chart. So 12 a.m. is at the top of the screen. 12 p.m. is at the bottom of the screen. And you just grab that 5 a.m., alarm and drag it to the time of day that you want it Mm. and when you get close enough you tap above or below the line and it will increment or or the opposite decrement decrement? (laughs) is that the word it is by five minutes Mm. so you can just uh every time i move my alarm it takes me like 10 seconds i'm just like click click slide tap 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 done which is really cool i don't have to 
type into a keypad or something like I, it's something I can do with one hand without even really thinking about it. And in the same way, the uh, timer function, which I now use all the time when I'm cooking or walking away from something in the kitchen, it's a simple, uh, just one one handed operation where it's got a basically a stopwatch uh, laid out on the screen. You just click and spin it around as if you're winding it up. And I can keep spinning, go backwards, and it adds an hour at a time, two hours, and then I just punch a big play button in the middle and it starts counting down. And uh, the other overall function of the app is it's beautiful to look at. Mm. It's got all of these glowing, bubbly things going on in the back. It's it's uh, pretty without being distracting. And I think it's meant to like uh, to be used as a default screen for your phone. So mm-hmm. if, if you wanted this like pretty clock up on your screen with your notifications for alarms and stuff, you could just leave that up on your screen. It would be nice to look at. Uh, I'm looking at it in the Play Store now. It does look very nice. It's, uh, it's look, very look. nice looking, and it's free. And it's free. Uh, I, I noticed that in their screenshots, they are all on uh, Saturday, August 17th, which is my birthday. And I told them to do that. Thank you, Sean. Thank You're you. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, does Quinn's alarm sound something like this? I'm awake. I'm awake. Turn it off. <laughs> That's the one. Is it like UFO or something? Uh, it's called sci-fi. Okay, that works. It's capital S, capital plan S. Plan nine. Plan, plan nine to wake you up from <laughs> solid sleep. So um, the second app I want to talk about is called uh, Aviary, and it is a photo editing suite. I take a lot of pictures on my phone and on my DSLR, and in the past as I grew up with computers and everything, I would have always taken these pictures that I was probably going to post online somewhere in the past, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. And I'd load them up into Photoshop and I'd like tweak little things, change some levels, change some contrast or whatever. And then I'd upload them, which was like a multi-step process. Like I'm running from a camera to my phone or my phone to my computer and editing and then pushing to the internet. Aviary is a pretty powerful photo editing suite that just exists on my phone or on my tablet and does most of the same stuff I was going to do without all of the technical know-how. It's got filters, so like the Instagram filters that everyone is used to, stuff like that. But then it's also got a bunch of normal functions like changing the brightness and contrast, saturation levels. Um, you can do that thing that I'm forgetting the word for now where you basically desaturate some parts of the photo and leave other parts in full color. Mm. Uh, and then it, uh, because it's on your tablet or whatever, you can push it to whatever platform you're using, Tumblr or Instagram or Facebook. And uh, it takes out all of that middleman of actually going to your PC and doing all of it in an application that is 100 times more powerful than what you actually need. Right. I'm I'm on the Aviary website right now, and one thing that's very cool about it is, well, one, it's free, uh, and two, uh, it has an SDK, and it itself can be integrated into other applications that are about taking photos. So Aviary, uh, I like app, I like apps that, as services that do this. That it it it's making itself widely available, so that you know, let's say Sean has an idea to, I want to make uh, an app that. Um, takes photos and you can do stuff to those photos and then it pushes it to your uh and it pushes it to tumblr or something and uh you don't want to have to come up with like the actual manipulation of the photos because that's really hard you can just basically integrate aviary right into your app right there okay very yeah, very I didn't nice know that it did that that's awesome yeah very very nice uh the coolest thing that i did with it at first that i was just like the future is awesome was I had taken a bunch of pictures on my DSLR, and that I really do have to plug into a computer to get the pictures off. But what I did was I put them all on my Dropbox account, and then I booted up Aviary on my tablet, and I can access my Dropbox account. So I didn't need to do anything with like transferring hard copies, whatever. I just logged into my Dropbox account, started pulling down photos, and picking which ones I wanted to edit and push up. Yeah, uh, Dropbox is incredible. I hate that I keep filling it up, and I don't want to pay for it. I pay for it. I'm going to have to eventually. It, it's worth it. Uh, so you have a DSLR, so this 
uh, this question, you know, probably has, you know, an answer already, but uh, I, uh, I don't have a DSLR and I don't really have a camera hobby, but I have a phone that has an amazing camera and I find that I don't use it very frequently. Do you think that apps like Aviary make you take more photos or is it just something that helps you deal with the photos that you would have taken already? I can, I can tell you that at when I first downloaded it, it got me very excited about taking pictures. And if you go back into my inst- back through my Instagram history, you can probably find the specific moment when I started doing that. Because all <laughs> of a sudden, I started like biking around town and taking pictures everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't say that that effect lasted, but I don't know if that's because of other things that are going on with me or what. But there was definitely a moment of inspiration where I was like, I have the tools right now to do all of this so simply that I would be stupid not to do it. Because I think Photoshop is very daunting most of the time because there's just so much. It's like you're trying to you're trying to dig a post hole with a bulldozer. All right. Well, it's uh, it's av- it's available for Android and for iOS, which is very nice. My uh, final app for your consideration is something that's new to me. And uh, I'm trying to integrate it into my daily life because that is exactly what it's meant to do. It's called Habit RPG. Have you heard of this? I have. (laughs) Gamify your life. Yeah, basically the idea is that um, in a lot of the games that we play these days, there are a lot of bars to fill, right? Like everything is you have to get to the next level. You have to fill up your silos or click the cows or whatever like there's tasks that you have to do that build you to the next level the idea of this app is that you are supposed to take the things that are boring in your life that are either good or bad and qualify and quantify them in some way that you can track them on this app and as you do them you will quote unquote level up you will gain experience and you will unlock rewards. And really, it's not like any of those things are actually happening, except for in your own head. Because these are things that you want to do to make yourself better, or things that you want to make yourself aware that you are doing that are not great for you. And then reward yourself by putting in what you want to be able to allow yourself once you reach certain goals. So for instance, when I opened up this app, it gave me a couple ideas for what I could begin with. And the first three things that are listed as habits that were in the app were one hour of productive work. And that has a little plus sign by it because that's a good thing. Uh, Eat junk food, which has a little negative sign by it. And then uh, take the stairs, which is positive or negative. I'm not sure why. (laughs) Why would that be negative? I don't know. I I wondered that. Maybe it was just an example that you could have one that was either or. Um, Mm. But anyway, I uh, because I want to make a Take the stairs versus scaling the side of the building is probably right. on the negative side. Take the stairs versus, you know, taking the the trolley up. So, like, uh, it's a habit of mine and a good habit that I uh, am productive and record a podcast. So I threw mm-hmm. that in there and hit my little plus sign, and it's like uh, it, it built my bar up just a fraction so that I can tell that uh, I'm doing good. And then... Uh, because I uh, got some soda today, and I'm not supposed to be doing that, I hit the little eat junk food thing, and it said that I lost HP. So now my little dude, who kind of looks like uh, Marklar from Marklar, uh, his bar is not as full as it was. It's got a little sliver off of it. Womp womp. So then also in the the app, it's got a to-do list, which you can tie that into your XP goals. It's got um, a reward section where you can tell it... Uh, what you want to be able to do as you gain your experience. And the things it has in here are like uh, one episode of Game of Thrones costs 20 points. Uh, Cake costs 10 points. And then uh, I guess just for the hell of it, it's it's got actual RPG things in here like uh, leather armor and sword. Right. So it's an interesting idea, and I'm trying to become healthier and adjust to better lifestyle choices and... This requires some dedication yourself. It's not like it's going to happen, but neither are all of those choices. It's all going to be you yourself doing it to yourself anyway. Right. How long have you been using this application? I downloaded it uh, earlier this week, a couple of days. Okay, so not very long. No. Have you noticed it making any uh, any impact on your daily life yet? I like... definitely think about it. Mm-hmm. 
it's on my mind when I consider, you know, buying that soda. That you're not going to be able to get the leather sword as fast. <laughs> right. It's like, ah, shucks, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to fight the, the demon with, a, you know. My hands. With your Bare yeah. knuckles. Bare yeah, knuckle b- box because the demon. Because basically um, part of the light, bad lifestyle choice is you don't want to continue to reward yourself for the bad things. So if you put on here that you're not allowed to buy South Park Stick of Truth until you reach whatever goal, and then you hold yourself to that, you're going to have to make the good choices and ignore mm-hmm. the bad ones. That makes sense. That makes sense. It seems uh, like I might get frustrated with an app like this uh, if it didn't have all of the little specific things that I want in there and that I might get frustrated having to change and add things to it. Do you, is it easy to just like, I want to add, like add, record a podcast yeah. and assign, and the points sort of make sense or do you have to put a lot of thought in like the points? I don't know. I don't think I've found the way to determine the points. I My XP bar is going up, but I actually haven't gained any coins and I don't know where I get the coins. They're probably in an app purchase. <laughs> I also have a few apps that I'm going to uh, that I'm going to talk about, uh, and the first app uh, that I have is also sort of like a health and lifestyle app, uh, and I have been using it. I can actually open it up and tell you I have been using it since February 5th. So it is a pedometer app, which seems sort of basic, right? Like an app that just tracks your steps. Uh, but I'd never had an app that tracked my steps, and I'd never had a pedometer before. And I, like many people, carry my phone around with me all the time. So it's very convenient to have that. And I particularly like this app. Uh, it's called Pedometer Plus Plus. And all it is... So Pedometer uh, Plus One. Yes. Or, yeah, exactly. It's incrementing pedom- the pedometer uh, as opposed to decrementing it. Uh, all it is uh, is... The top of the screen is in big numbers how many steps you've taken today, and then underneath it, how many miles that is. And you can change that to kilometers if you're, you know, weird. Or like most people. From anywhere except here. (laughs) Weird people using this base 10 system. I don't know, you know, craziness. Uh, and that's that's like the perfect design for the for the app, right? It's just screaming at you how many steps you take. But the the beauty of the app is it's uh, is how cruel it is. So you set a, a daily step goal, and my daily step goal is thirteen thousand steps. Uh, and is that like uh, five miles? It is like, but it's like five and three quarters. Okay. Miles wow, I'm ish. good. Uh, so for me, it's like five and three quarters miles because you, it also using the, so this is an iPhone only app and actually you can only use it on the newest iPhone. So just a caveat there because it uses the M7 coprocessor in the iPhone, which, uh, is dedicated to figuring out stuff about where the iPhone is located in, in space. Oh, okay. And it stores that information right in that processor. So it's outside of the CPU. And that also means that the app doesn't have to be open ever to get that data because the data is something that the system always stores. But what the app will do is uh, when you first use it, it connects to the M7 processor and it figures some stuff out with math to when if you give it your height, it figures out your gait, basically, how okay. far a step for you is. Anyway, you set your step goal and... Until you get halfway to that step goal of the day, everything in the app is red. And between half and 100%, it's just like sort of burnt orange. And then finally, when you get to your step goal, it's this really pleasant green. Yeah. And it's just like you could be at 12,999 steps. And actually, I on Sunday, last Sunday, I took 12,322 steps. I didn't quite make 13,000. And along the bottom of the app, it has every day of the week, and you can scroll through it, and it says how many steps you, you made, and it's still orange, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's like, well, ah, sorry, it's, bro. It's like that whole fill in the bars thing. Like, you mm-hmm. want everything to end up green. Exactly. Um, and you and uh, you also can go back through my history, and you can see, like, the weekend days and, like, what days I didn't really get out of the house. Uh, or <laughs> So there was a snow day where I took only 400 steps. That was because I just, like, let I put my phone down on something in my house, and I just never left the house. Uh, 
but I've never done that again because I was like, that's not fair. I did take steps. It's just I didn't have my phone in my pocket. So now I always wear something in my house that has pockets so that I can have my phone with me at all times. I'm like, no, those steps count. I want those steps on pedometer plus plus. So uh, it definitely is impacting your lifestyle. It has impacted my lifestyle. And if you, it, uh, one of the really nice features of the app is you can go to settings. There is a big export button and it will take all of your data in just like a tab delimited file and e you can email it to yourself and it's just the date and the step count and you can if you're so inclined i don't know upload it into some statistics software and analyze what has happened to you over time and my mean steps has increased every like week over week for the past four weeks and i know it's because i like i'm like no i want to i want to make sure i get these steps in i'm almost tempted now to raise my i was just gonna say so do you date. think you will bump up your goal I started at 12,000 and now I'm at 13 and I'm thinking about setting it to 15,000 steps. And uh I and the really cool thing about the the app and the integration with the iPhone is it will grab the last 6 days worth of data from the processor and it will load it into the app once you've downloaded it so you already have steps. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so so it doesn't start out with a blank screen. It it already starts out with like here are your step totals from the last six days, even though you didn't have the app. This was someone who was like looking through the functions of the iPhone five and was like, you could use this data to do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. So I cannot. Uh, it, it's free as well. So I cannot more highly recommend Pedometer Plus Plus. It also has another killer feature. Uh, because the iPhone uh, is limited in many ways, if this was an app on an, on an Android device, it would probably have like a little widget that has your step count on your home screen. Yeah. You can't do that on an iPhone. But you can have a badge on any app that shows like how many missed calls you have or how many unread emails you have. You can flip a switch in the app so that it badges itself with your current steps. So you don't have to open it. It's always don't even right have, there. Don't even have to open it. So I can look down at mine and I'm at 13,701 for the day. Very I clever. One. I Yeah, so uh, Pedometer++, Plus Plus, it's free. It's available for iPhones. Only iPhone 5S, sorry. But, plus uh, is, is uh, not spelled. It's actual it is, pluses. It, 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 yeah, Pedometer++, plus sign, plus sign. Uh, the second app that I'm going to talk about is another app that I use every single day, and it is called Zite. This has been around for a few years now, and actually it made the news this week. It, uh, it was acquired by Flipboard, uh, so I hope it stays around. <laughs> All these companies that get acquired sometimes make me nervous. Uh, Zite is a very simple idea. It is a personal uh, magazine for you with news from the day, but that just pertains to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that you initially set up Zite is you give it your Twitter uh, credential, and what it will do is it will go and find the people that you follow and the types of things that you tweet about, and it will start customizing your news feed based on that information, and it grabs things from mostly from Twitter. So it knows what's news on Twitter, what's a blog post, and it's grabbing that kind of stuff. And then on every single uh, article, you get this just like very infinite scrolling view of articles that are just little cards. On every single one of them, uh, it has some metadata about what the uh, article is about. So I just opened my Zite. Uh, my first one is about uh, a medical marijuana ad that never aired despite contrary media headlines. It's from Money Magazine, and its primary category is advertising. And if I open it up... Uh, I'll get the ad, and then at the bottom, I've got a, a thumbs up, a thumbs down. Uh, so if I like these types of articles, I can thumb them up, and if I don't like them, I can thumb them down, and I'll get more or less of them. Uh, I can also just, like, block things totally. It's like, oh, I don't like CNN money at all. I've got a button to be like, never show me anything from CNN money ever. Uh, and uh, and then there's the ubiquitous share button. So any article that I have on there, I can also just send it in an email. Uh, I can send it to Twitter, and really great I can Instapaper it, another app I use all the time. I can say, oh, I'm really interested in this article. I don't have time to read it right now. Just put it in my Instapaper for me, and I'll read it you know, uh, later in the day. Uh, I get almost all of my news from Zite. Uh, I follow such a variety of people on Twitter that a lot of times I'm not getting news from them. So Zite is a nice way to distill down all of the things those people are saying into kind of more... 
uh, actionable articles that I can read through the day. And I am constantly finding that people reference articles on Twitter several hours after I've read them on Zeit already mm -hmm. during the day. Um, and it slowly updates itself probably every couple hours. So if you go to Zeit constantly, you'll be like, oh, it's all the same articles. But if you go sort of, you know, in the morning every day, it's going to be a whole new set of articles. And it has one very nice feature that I, I, I really enjoy this for showing you uh, read versus unread. Any article that you've read, uh, so the way, it, the way it's designed is the articles are displayed in a card. The top of the card is the headline and the bottom is an image. If you've read it, it everything is gray. Okay. And the unread, unread ones are in full color. Uh, so it's really obvious for you. You're like, oh, yeah, I already read that article. So Zeit is free. It's available on, like, every single platform that you can imagine. And I think there might even be a web interface for it. Uh, and it's a great way to get your news. When, uh, when did this program come into existence? I believe that I got Zeit in late 2011. Okay. So I've been using it for a long time. Uh, with one of the most recent updates, updates of Android they added something called Google Now. And mm -hmm. I, I had never heard of this feature before, and I just it was like, do you want to turn it on? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Screw it. <laughs> and um, I think that Google Now ripped off some of these ideas. And I don't know if they're Zeit's ideas or other someone else. Mm -hmm. But it's basically like um, it gets better and better the more that you use Google. It takes everything that you search for and then starts presenting you with things that you might be interested in it's not nearly as focused as Zite, and i don't think that there's a i don't think there's really a way to qualify it beyond what it shows you i don't think you can like thumbs up and thumbs down stuff mm -hmm. but, but basically every time i open google on my phone which is anytime i search for something it below my search box it's going to give me a whole bunch of stuff like um right now it's showing me an article about uh lena dunham hosting snl because i i read a lot of stuff about snl uh mm -hmm. it's showing me an article about gta 5 uh dlc potential whatever something um and then it's also got uh showtimes listed because it knows that i went to the movies recently and it also has here my travel time to work and the weather um it's it's more of a mishmash like what did the old google homepage used to look like do you remember like my google or whatever it was called oh god yeah that it, was horrible it's kind of like a version of that um, not nearly as focused as Zite, and I don't think it's nearly as customizable. Yeah. But definitely uh, some of the same ideas. Yeah, the card idea is has come into full being on mobile apps and mobile web views. Twitter uses cards. Google search uses cards now. You'll Like a lot of things that you search for, the very first thing isn't even an ad anymore. It's just like this kind of, it looks like a raised piece of thing that it's like, you know, if you Google a word, it's like, hey, here's the Wikipedia article for that word and the first couple things from it, and you can click on it. Or, oh, right, right. I know what you're talking weather, about. Weather, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, I, uh, I sent something to you the other day about how you can type in two movies, be like uh, Aliens versus Monsters versus uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, and it'll display in cards both of those movies right beside each other, and you can compare cast, crew, grosses. Uh, release dates, all that kind of stuff. Google now is uh, probably was inspired by some of these ideas. I bet Zeit was also inspired by some people, you know, by someone else with with these ideas. Uh, and the nice thing about Zeit is it you you don't have to have a you know a long Google history, but you do, you know you just have to have a, a you know a somewhat curated Twitter account. Mm -hmm. And if you don't. Regardless, the first steps of setting up Zite, it's like, here are lots of topics. Pick some of them that you like. Right. Um, and then add, and then it will start figuring things out on its own. But it helps if you hook it up with Twitter and let it kind of like figure some of those social things out for you. It has a very handsome I, uh, iPad tablet app. I, I'm, I'm sure it works on Android tablets, but maybe not. I, I assume it does. It is not my preferred way of using Zite. I like it on the phone where it's just one long list. Uh, but if you choose to use it on a tablet, it presents a more magazine-like uh, layout. So everything, the cards are kind of laid out next to each other, and they have these kind of insert cards that are, instead of being a, a, a story it's like, here are three related topics with a button that lets you flip through them, and you can see, like, oh, here's one, here's the next one. Oh, I like that one. Click on it. Goes to that article, then you can leave that article. It's very nice. So yeah, that's great. 
Zeit. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's uh, available for anyone who uses phones unless you have a Windows mobile phone, in which case, uh, sad for you. The last thing I'm, uh, I wanted to, to talk about, to chat about, I think Sean has some opinions about this, uh, is sort of kind of throwaway mobile games. Uh, and I'm not talking about like Flappy Bird, which I do have. Um, uh, I'm talking about uh, Nimble Bits or uh, the developer I'm interested in right now, Chilingo. Uh, so I actually have three of their apps up on my phone right now. I'm only playing one of them. Uh, and the one I'm playing right now is called Puzzle Craft. It's basically a way to play Bejeweled, but it has all of this stuff around it. <laughs> so you're like the mayor of a village. The village can grow crops. You use those crops to mine in the mines. And the mine is... The way you mine is a bejeweled game. Okay. And the way that you gather crops is also a bejeweled game. Uh, and you can use those things to purchase ways of getting more of those things in larger quantities and discover new types of them, right? So you start out just mining stone, but then you can mine iron and then coal and whatever, very Minecrafty progression there. Uh, it's a very familiar gameplay mechanic, right? There's this sort of in-game resource that you're constrained with, and then there's also obviously gold that you can in get, you know, in-app purchase, in purchase to get things faster. Uh, and there are timers on lots of things. So the main way of getting gold in-game, which you can get in this, which is not always true uh, for some of these apps. You can get gold in game, uh, but you can only get it by collecting taxes, which you can only do once like every four hours or something. Uh, I was playing a game similar to this a few, like a month ago called Pixel People, where you're basically building up a space station of dull or a, the space, you know, city. Uh, and you're, you know, you, you get these clones and these clones can have different like genetic types and the types are like hairdresser or you know movie star and as you get these new people they spawn new buildings you build the buildings and then you have this awesome like huge space thing and obviously there are timers like how fast the clones come in and there's an in-game currency and you know what have you the newest thing i've downloaded because i'm now getting tired of puzzle craft is called another case it's the exact same gameplay mechanic once again it's this timer and an in-game currency and you're mining for things but in this game you're trying to solve mysteries so you're like <laughs> mining so you're like mi you're mining for <laughs> details about a case <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> and you're trying to like level up your snooping ability right you're trying to buy a new you know whatever and i'm just fascinated by these companies who find ways to like take one gameplay mechanic is only one thing and they just slap new coats of paint on it and for some reason it does it for me i'm like yeah i'll play that for a while and then after a week or two i'm like i'm tired of this and it seems like they suddenly have a new app it's like oh chilingo has a new app well it's like oh you're a detective how fascinating and then <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I'm like, I'm just mining things and playing Bejeweled. Uh, but they get me every single time. Uh, I know that you you have been a fan of the Nimble Bits games as well, so I thought you might have uh, some thoughts on this. I know that you, you had been playing Tiny Death Star, which has exactly the same mechanic as Tiny Tower, but it's with the Death Star. Yeah, the, the Tiny Tower games are perfect for the, like... I'm doing something else, but I want to occupy my hands kind of gameplay. Like, mm -hmm. I can sit in front of the TV and not pay attention to the game, but also be succeeding in every way at the game. <laughs> right. And that's what, that is what the Tiny Tower games are. They're just time management games, and you just have to make quick decisions every five minutes, and then you go back to watching House of Cards or whatever. Exactly, but I know that you had had Tiny Tower, and you grew you know tired of it and then when tiny death star was out it's like well oh look a new thing <laughs> a new thing i'll do that <laughs> a new and, old know, thing yeah uh, exactly uh and i'm just i'm sort of fascinated by how these these companies you know get away with this i don't think that they're scamming anybody certainly but uh no we know what we're doing exactly i and i am making the choice i'm like i'm i'm not like, oh, this is going to be some great detective thriller mystery that I'm downloading. I'm like, I'm playing Bejeweled to, like, do things. I'm, 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 th th this is the most complicated way to play Bejeweled ever. 
uh, and I'm sort of fine with that. And uh, those uh, are, you know, th- those are my, uh, those are my bathroom games, right? Go right, to the bathroom, right. got like a couple minutes. It's like, well, I'll check on my little farm. It's like, oh, I can farm a little farm, farm, farm. And then it's like, okay, well, I'll check this again some other time. And I, I have no, I have nothing. I, there's, I, there's no stake for me, right? Right. Uh, it's not like a, an RPG. It's not a game over type of game. No, I also have two Final Fantasy, real whole Final Fantasy games on my phone, and I'm playing one of them. And that I am investing like time in, and I'm like working at it. And uh, I would be upset, you know, if things went badly in that game uh, because I, you know, I've already invested like four or five hours into it. But it's like, you know, if my crops don't get whatever, it's like, well, they don't get whatever. I don't care. Yeah, they, until you check it again. Exactly. So it's perfect in that way. My and- transition to mobile gaming actually happened with a bejeweled style gameplay game. It was on the very first episode of five things and it was puzzle quest Mm two. And it's a bejeweled style game with an RPG uh, thing overlaid on it. Mm -hmm. And I, when I put it on five things, it was on my DS, but almost immediately it was 2010. It started coming out on everything. And that was the first time that I was like, Oh, I can play this on my phone. Or my tablet, or I didn't have a tablet at the time, but eventually. And uh, that was like the end of my DS playing. Mobile has changed the way that gaming works pretty fundamentally because it's made everybody a gamer, but everybody isn't a gamer. Right. Not everybody has those skills, and it's not like a value judgment or anything. It's like, it's hard. You have to invest time to figure out how to maneuver a, a dude around in two or three dimensional space very accurately with a controller. Not everybody has the time or the inclination to figure that out. Um, so but they when might you, just want to click a cow. Exactly. But before, you know, when it was just consoles, it would be stupid to make cow, a cow clicker game for a console. It's like you want to make a big, full featured, rich game for the gamers, the, you know, the nerds who can manipulate the little dude on the screen. But it's like now that everybody has a thing. It, everything is going to get pulled down to the you know the most you know the most common attributes of the group and you know what can everybody do well they can tap a screen they can play bejeweled they can do those things um, and you know in some ways it's a little sad that like more skilled gamers people who enjoy more skill skillful games are sort of pushed out of that market uh, but that's kind of where we are with uh, with mobile games and that's I'll why still th- there's still PC gaming and console gaming and right everything like that and 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 that's souls too yeah and that's why you know to everyone who says like nintendo should make games for you know phones i say no they shouldn't they should just keep doing what they're doing they do it and they do it well and they're different they're different from playing those games so uh i i can totally respect the you know bejeweled games that have an rpg on top of them that aren't very hard and don't take much skill or time or effort uh, but I also like to play, you know, a little Zelda or, you know, whatever back on a console. I, I can have, I can, I can deal with both of those. I'm glad we it. found a way to bring that back to Nintendo. Yeah, always Nintendo. Always be Nintendoing. This podcast, Broke the Internet, is a production of five things. If you have comments or feedback, you can find us on Twitter at Podcast Broke or use the hashtag Podcast Broke. Episode 7 is brought to you by the Professional Theremin Operators Association of America. And thanks for listening. I'm Carter, and this podcast broke the internet. I'm Sean, and this week, film adaptations are breaking the internet. So, why do you think people make film adaptations, Sean? Just don't have any good original ideas? They gotta steal them from books? Um, yeah, that's what I've always assumed. Yeah. It's so um, that you can watch all of the Harry Potter series in 14 hours instead of reading it over the course of 40 hours. That's true. That's true. I was actually confused uh, with the Harry Potter film adaptations 
I was confused by Warner Brothers' decision not to start chunking them into parts earlier. Right, because they could have drawn it out more, made more money. Exactly, although they, I get the impression and kind of know a little bit that the productions were really intensive, so if they had started chunking them where they should have, like at Goblet of Fire... The actors would have been in their 30s. They would have been like 55 years old by the time it was <laughs> over, and you'd be like, that seems impossible. Then they would have had to do a separate whole thing with the film series... Uh, with, like, time turners or something. Right. And time travel. They would have had to use the real time travel. <laughs> they would have had to invent it. Invent well, time travel. So traveling. you know how, like, James Cameron, like, invents technologies? Right. They would have had to invent time travel. So we're talking about film adaptations, and uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, a little story by Mr. Frank Herbert called Dune. Hey, Sean, have you read Dune? <laughs> You've been asking me this question for three fucking years. No, I haven't read Dune. Oh, okay. I just wanted to make sure. Maybe maybe between when I mentioned it before we started recording and now, you had like downloaded it onto your Kindle and like One of these times I'm going to surprise you and you're just going to ask me for the upteenth time and I'm going to be like, "Yeah, I read that book." Yeah. Gosh. Well, gosh. Gosh, Carter. Uh even though Sean has not read Dune, I'm sure you're aware of its kind of historical importance in the science fiction genre. Yeah, something about sandworms. Exactly. Uh, and it has been adapted into uh, film, not, not only once, but twice. Uh, and one of the times uh, that it was adapted into a film, uh, it, uh, it, it was a pretty spectacularly expensive flop and the second time that it was adapted into a film it was uh, a spectacularly expensive flop (laughs) (laughs) so um, wait are we talking about Battlefield Earth Oh, right, exactly. So the, the the Battlefield Earth, that that was going to be a flop because the book was garbage. Uh, but Dune is actually is, is widely known as a classic. It's great literature. Um, but in 1984, David Lynch tried to do an adaptation, and it was a total failure. I think they spent almost $80 million in 1980s money, which was a lot. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, John Harrison adapted it for the Sci-Fi Channel for not an insignificant amount of money, uh, and it was also largely seen as a failure. And there is a future planned adaptation coming, st- being stewarded by Herbert's son, Brian Herbert. Uh that is in script hell right now. So these guys are gluttons for punishment. Exactly. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about uh, with adapting Dune is <laughs> it's been adapted twice. Someone's trying it for a third time. It seems really clear that people really want this to be something visual and something cinematic, and it just keeps failing. It just won't work. And I I kind of thought about it for a little while, and I kind of sketched out my three reasons why I think that Dune adaptations as film always fail. This is, this is your uh, graduate thesis? Exactly, exactly. Um, so these three ideas are... They start very superficial, uh, and they become more... Uh, getting to the core of the problem, I think. Um, so the first and the most basic and superficial reason why I think both of the Dune adaptations has, have, have failed um, are the visual effects. So even having not seen the David Lynch version of Dune, I'm sure you have some idea of what it looked like. I can understand that in 1984... It would be hard to do. Not a great time. No. One of the things that, like, one of the, like sort of film criticisms that I have of that movie just generally is that it's very dark. Not, like, in tone, but it's lit very dark. And I think one of the reasons why it's lit so dark is because they just couldn't get the visual effects right, so they're like, just make it dark. (laughs) So it's hard to see. (laughs) It's hard to see, just make it dark. Um, And they had no CGI, because the very first CGI movie ever, Tron, was made also in 1984. Same year. So there was no computer graphics to be had. Uh, Disney was inventing it at the time. 
it was all rotoscoping and compositing and uh, practical effects. And the stuff that's going on in Dune is kind of fantastic, right? It's a desert planet. Uh, there are spaceships and, you know, people can, like, fly around. And there are these giant worms that are, like, kilometers long. Uh, there's atomic weapons and lasers and all that kind of stuff. And I just think that, yeah, the visual effects weren't there and it really brings the movie back uh and it, likewise with the more modern adaptation on the sci-fi channel and the problem there in 2000 you know 16 years later was they totally had computer graphics but they didn't have a budget to do good computer graphics so it's just really obviously bad cgi all the time everywhere uh and if if the 1984 dune was too dark the 2000 Dune is way too light. It's everything is bright and sunny, and there's no shadows on anything <laughs> ever. Uh, because I don't know why, because they just couldn't get the CGI to work that way. So, trying to realize a world, uh, a total world that is encapsulated in this book, uh, is really tough. And I think that when you have bad visual effects, it's just going to turn out really poorly. Um, Okay, so the second reason why I think that both of these adaptations failed is the actor who they got to play the main character in both of them was just not right. So Paul is, in the book, supposed to be a 14-year-old boy who ages a couple years over the course of the story. Oh my god, really? Yeah. Because I know who plays him. Yeah, he's 14, and I think that he ends up being 17 at the end. Uh, And... He is preternaturally smart. He's precocious. Uh, but he's supposed to be a child. <laughs> okay. And he grows into a very confident, still young man. So it's a, a Bildung's Roman. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, for the German speakers out there. Uh, or the and, English majors. Or the English majors. Who majored in English, though, right, Sean? Garrison Killer. In the 1984 version, it was uh, Kyle MacLachlan, who I believe was in his late 20s. Yeah. And in the uh, the modern version, oh, I don't have it open. I'm sorry. Uh, it is an Australian actor who was a similar age. And what they do is they put them in ridiculous clothing and they have them act so against their age at the beginning of the movies and then they just throw it out about 10% into the movie they just totally forget that they're trying to play a teenager and then they're like oh never mind they're old now in payment of the many years of service to my family you may now ask of me anything you wish anything at all do you need my life old friend it is yours I mean this too far. If you are to strike, do it now. And they just let them inhabit those character, that character as an older man. And that's hugely detrimental to the story because so much of the story in the book is told from the point of view of Paul, who is trying to deal with the fact that he is a child who was born to nobility, who had to flee with his mother into the desert when his father was murdered by, you know, in this political intrigue. And he has to figure out how to grow up and become a man in that situation. And if you are if you have actors who are already grown men, how, how can they possibly convey that emotional journey? Right. That's... The second reason why you, you need a, a Mark Hamill circa 1977. Ma- yes, exactly. I didn't even think about that. That is a perfect example. You could get a, a 19 year old who is young looking and who can convey that that journey. Uh, but you can't get like a 25 year old dude who is obviously a man. Right. You can't have Harrison Ford do it. Right. The third reason, the big reason why I think all both of these fail, there's tr- they just don't work, is that they don't realistically deal with the politics that is described in the book. One of the really cool things about Dune is how 
political everything is. It's like a master's course in interpersonal relationships. And it's it's so in both of in both of the movies, it's such an afterthought. The relationships between the families, between the families and the emperor, there is this spacing guild that deals with interstellar travel, how the economy works. It's that's the central like core idea of the book. And in the movies, they both take the planet and the ecosystem as the core idea that it's all about this desert planet and oh isn't it interesting that it's a desert and they're trying to turn it into be a uh, paradise that's such an interesting idea and it is an, it is an interesting idea but the the sinew of the book the the thing that makes the plot happen is the politics that there is this Atreides family that our main characters are a part of, and they have a vendetta against another noble family, the Harkonnens. And they're in this power structure where there's the emperor, and there is this congress, and everyone has nuclear weapons. And how do you deal with power politics when it's very personal, but people have nukes that so they can use against each other? What this is sounding like to me is the wrong people are making this project, and it should be handed to the team that is currently developing Game of Thrones for HBO. Yeah. And that brings me to my final point about Dune, and that is a, my modest proposal for any future adaptations. And one of them might be, yeah, have the Game of Thrones people do it, because they clearly know what they're doing. The politics of George R. R. Martin's universe is clear in the series, even if they don't go into the, the mind-numbing detail from the books. They still cover all of that. And it's easy to understand from yes. by a layperson. Exactly. And one of the things that I think that's really neat about Game of Thrones is that it deals with politics, but it... it when people talk about politics, you know, they usually think of like, oh, it's a section of the paper that I read about. And it's like people get elected to stuff and whatever. And that's not what politics is. Politics is how you deal with other people, like institutionally. And <laughs> frequently throughout the course of human history, it's how families have dealt with one another. And that is really clear in Game of Thrones. And that's how Dune is set up as well. My proposal to get around the visual effects, to get around the fact that they can never cast Paul right, and to maybe make the politics more interesting and, and do it right, is it should be an animated feature. One of the problems both of these adaptations ran into is how do you make a kilometer-long worm that lives in the sand look realistic on film? Yeah, And the answer is, without a quarter of a billion dollars and some g crazy genius, you probably can't make it look terribly realistic. So why not just give up the ghost on that and say, we're going to make it be an animated feature. That way you have the freedom to make whatever compelling landscape you want. You can cast the Paul character appropriately. Like maybe Kyle MacLachlan has a really good voice for Paul, but he just doesn't look like him. You can draw him so he looks like a kid and have whoever you need voice him. And then you can tell the story in what I think is the most the more appropriate medium. So I'm gonna get up right on my letter writing campaign after this to Brian Herbert and say, hey, don't don't do this on film. Make now, it. Now are, make are it you a thinking cartoon. like C G I or I I feel like this could make an awesome anime film i will tell you that i was thinking about this when i was watching nausicaa of the valley of the wind okay because when i saw the alms i was thinking wow that would be ludicrous if it was anything other than an anime it would not look right. real right and right, it would right. be totally implausible but in anime it looks really cool it looks good and I was thinking, if Miyazaki did a Dune adaptation, the worms would be very impressive looking. The The scope and the scale would be totally appropriate. Uh, you could totally animate the, the world so that it looked right. Because in the universe of Dune, humans have been in space for 12,000 years. Like, it's an old culture at that point. Yeah. Well, he's retired, but his son has already taken on the Earthsea series, mm -hmm. Ursula... Kayla Gwynn, but if he's looking for epic 
kind of stories to tell, maybe this is the direction you should go. Maybe. And it only gets more epic and and bizarre and crazy from the first Dune book. I mean, this is a series where in the first book, it's like humans on a planet where there is an economically viable uh, commodity. And by the fourth book, it's, well, one of the characters from a pre- previous book is has now turned into a worm, and he's 4,000 years old, and he rules over a galactic empire. Oh. <laughs> and then by the sixth book, it's like, and now we're just blowing up planets. It's ripe. You know, for... following everything to its logical conclusion. Exactly, but I think it would still be ripe for anime. I'm going to I'm going to surprise you uh-huh. by talking about a film adaptation called Adaptation. Hoo-hoo. You have seen Adaptation, correct? I have. I have. Um Spike Jones and Charlie Kaufman are a director writer uh, collaboration. They've made two films together, being John Malkovich and then Adaptation. Mm-hmm. And Charlie Kaufman is kind of an unusual Hollywood writer. Um, I don't think that there's anyone writing in the industry right now who writes anything like what he writes. It's just so he so focused on surrealism in adaptation. He writes a mo- a movie about himself adapting a book for a movie, which is the movie that you're watching. Yep. It's really hard to get your head around even the first time that you watch it. It really, it's one of those films that just demands a rewatch before you're like, well, now I understand what's going on. And the reason it's especially hard to understand is because the book that he's adapting in the movie is a real book called The Orchid Thief. And it's about a New Yorker writer named Susan Orlean, who is telling the story of a man named John LaRoche, who was um, poaching orchids with uh, some Native Americans in the Florida, like, state preserve, like, where you're not allowed to go. And Mm -hmm. uh, he was doing it illegally, but he said that he was doing it for the sake of their heritage, because it's their land and their flowers. And they are actually using it this whole time to get high. It is a drug, and that's what they're using it for. Um, but the reason she writes the book is because she becomes a person who is unsatisfied with her life, and she's looking for people who show real passion. And she thinks that John LaRoche is someone who shows real passion. So Charlie Kaufman, the real Charlie Kaufman, is is uh, slated to adapt this book into a film. And if you believe the story that you see on the film, which I'm not really sure if we can or not, he is really struggling to adapt it because there's no real plot. There's no real uh, ethos or pathos or any of the things that any scriptwriter will tell you that like you need to find in order to turn it into a film. And he decides that just like Susan Orlean, he's looking for the passion in life. And through the help of his twin brother, who in the film, both him and his twin brother are played by Nicolas Cage, um, he decides that he needs to actually tell the story of himself telling the story. And that's where all of the passion comes from. And it turns into a gigantic satire on basically the formula of a Hollywood thriller. There are two ways that he gets to do that. His brother, his twin brother, is not a real person. He's a made-up person for the film. Even though he's credited on the screenplay, his twin brother is at the same time attending a, uh, a, a seminar by a real person uh, who got to handpick his own casting in the film. Uh, Robert McKee is a, is a guy who, talk, who writes books and does seminars about screenwriting. And uh, he got to cast himself as Brian Cox in the film. And they do actually look very similar if you look at pictures of Robert McKee. And uh, Robert McKee comes up constantly. Um, any uh, AAA action title released by Hollywood is going to have some elements that have been covered by Robert McKee. I watched a keynote 
uh, about the writing of The Last of Us, the PlayStation 3 title. And the guy who wrote that story referred to Robert McKee because everything that you always look for in these kind of films, the things that you don't even realize that you're looking for following uh, characters to their logical ending point, uh, rising action and falling action, all of this stuff has been covered by Robert McKee. He has figured out what we look for when we go to movies that we like about movies. And so his twin brother is going to these things and coming home and then telling him like, ah, oh, Robert said this best, the best stuff about how we got to have characters do this and characters do that. And he wants to pay no attention to him because he's like, I'm not writing a formulaic Hollywood thriller. I'm writing the story about orchids and beauty and passion. And then at one point he's like, so what did Robert say about that? And basically he ends up falling into the same trap. And then in the film, the film that you're watching, you see him use all of the exact same things that he just said he wasn't going to use, including putting characters in more mortal danger, including having characters die in his in his life. Uh, spoiler alert, his twin brother, who doesn't actually exist, dies for to give you this uh, severe reaction to watching the passion that he has for his brother and how much he loves him even though he doesn't exist, it, it puts all of that emotion into you and you find yourself tricked into experiencing all of the things that he says he doesn't want to put into his screenplay. It's one of those movies that every time I hear someone who says that they like movies that make you think or movies that are different from whatever, I'm like, have you seen Adaptation? Because I think it's impossible to talk about movies that make you think and think about the process behind them without talking about adaptation. Yes. Sir, what if a writer is attempting to create a story where nothing much happens, where people don't change, they don't have any epiphanies, they struggle and are frustrated and nothing is resolved, more a reflection of the real world? Nothing happens in the world? Genocide, war, corruption, every fucking day, somewhere in the world, somebody sacrifices his life to save somebody else. Every fucking day, someone somewhere takes a conscious decision to destroy someone else. People find love. People lose it. For Christ's sake, a child watches a mother beaten to death on the steps of a church. Someone goes hungry. Somebody else betrays his best friend for a woman. If you can't find that stuff in life, then you, my friend, don't know crap about life. And why the fuck? Are you wasting my two precious hours with your movie? I don't have any use for it. I don't have any bloody use for it. Okay, thanks. I think of I saw it the last time I saw it, I rented it from a blockbuster. Wow. I, I rewatch it every so often. I don't own it. It's not and uh, it's not just because of all that. It's because it's one of those movies that you just you really like Nick Cage in. He's very he's, he's very, so good in it. He's very good in it. He is very good in it. This podcast broke the internet is a production of Five Things. If you have comments or feedback, you can find us on Twitter at podcastbroke or use the hashtag podcastbroke. This episode was animated in front of a live studio audience by Hayao Miyazaki. Thanks for listening. My name is Sean, and this podcast broke the internet. And I'm Carter, and this week, Deus Ex Minecraft is breaking the internet. So, Sean, how did you find Minecraft? Um, Paul Soros Jr. I don't remember how or why, but uh, it was at the time when Minecraft was very new. It had just moved into beta. And there was just, it was probably in my suggested videos. And it was like, you should watch Survive and Thrive on Paul Soros Jr. And I was like, I have no idea what this is. And for whatever reason, uh, that was at the time when I still just browsed YouTube for fun. Haven't done that for a while. Huh. And uh, 
I watched this first episode that Paul had put up of how to uh, survive your first night in this game called Minecraft. And as I was watching his video, I went to the Mojang website and bought it. Interesting. So when you watched, so Paul Soares Jr. is probably was a famous Minecraft YouTuber. I don't even know if he does things anymore. No idea. Was it what Paul was doing that drew you to Minecraft, or was it just the fact that it was this open world where you could do whatever uh, that made you want to get the game? Um, or, uh, it, let, me, let me ask it in a different way. Was it the public aspect of what Paul was doing that drew you to it, or was it the game itself? It was the game. I was very interested in... Uh, it was it was kind of him because the way that he was talking about it was with a foreknowledge of what to expect, but mm -hmm. a lot of what we were seeing as he was playing in the first episode uh, was not that. It was just like, you will have to think about this. We, we will have to worry about the zombies at night. You will have to start gathering this supply and this supply to get prepared to, to build a base or something. And I was like, oh, my God, there are all these different things that you could do and all these different threats and things you have to think about. And I saw how much the game was, which at the time was probably less than $20. And I was like, this isn't even I don't even have to think about this. This is done. Uh, so do you remember what your first experiences just playing Minecraft were like? Very similar to Paul's. Um, I, I'm sure I had it set on normal difficulty and I just started gathering things, found a place to call home probably died a couple times, <laughs> which kind of became my, my singular trait of playing Minecraft and just generally being in awe of the thing that still draws me to Minecraft, which is basically just the, the creation of the random world. That's still the coolest thing to me. Right. So we're recording this in March of 2014. You must have downloaded this, in probably late 2011, I'm going to guess. Uh, so we're, we're nearly three years apart from that. Uh, do, you, do you still find yourself loading up vanilla Minecraft worlds? No. Like you did then, no? No. Do, or somewhat modded vanilla Minecraft worlds. Ah, uh, not even in. that, because I get too frustrated with the, the modding process. Okay, so uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the game itself. Uh, how long did you, when, once you first downloaded the game, how long did it take you uh, before you kind of like got frustrated with the game and stopped playing it? A long time, because it wasn't until I, I, made, I, I started playing it. I got really involved. I started making little private servers for me and my friends. Um, I basically had a, I had an old laptop that I just like left on all the time so that me and my friends could jump on the server and build stuff and then I started very shortly after that started involving Minecraft in my videos which was really the first and only huge bump that I ever had on my YouTube channel and that just didn't that didn't slow anything down because all of a sudden I was like oh my god I can really go places with this and it wasn't until I really felt burned out on making Minecraft series that I was finally like I just need to stop. I there, this is killing me somehow. Some part of my soul is dying every time I drag myself into another Minecraft map, expecting to have that same experience again that I haven't had in a long time. Um, so we've kind of we've kind of hit on a, a nice transition point between uh, the game and uh, and then your your sort of broader involvement in uh, in Minecraft. What inspired you to make the arrival? I looked through a lot of videos that people were doing. And what I saw uh, was a lot of Let's Plays. I didn't see, this was before there were music video parodies for everything under the sun. This is before there were any kind of storytelling, anything. And uh, the I think the only people who are doing anything like this are the people who are still doing things like this, and that's Yogscast. I know that other people have definitely come along and done stuff like this since, but I wanted to tell some kind of story, and this changed a lot later, from a third-person perspective. Because Minecraft is first-person, and everything that everyone was shooting was first-person, and I wanted to put the camera outside of the person's body and then also kind of play with my newfound uh, interest in video editing 
and try and make something fun. I didn't know what it was, but I wanted to try and make something creative and fun. And I think part of that was um, watching Rooster Teeth's Red vs. Blue and getting that idea of what you can actually be done in machinima. And then part of that was also like everything that I've ever read, like any throw in some science fiction, throw in some humors, throw in all these different ingredients that made what was eventually the arrival. <sighs> okay. All right. I'm up. I'm up. Oh, let's see what we got today. Oh, yeah. Look at all the things that need to die today. When you, when you started making The Arrival, how, how difficult of a project was that for you? It was way harder than I expected it to be. So, um, if, if you don't mind, uh, can you talk about the, the technical difficulties and then maybe talk about any sort of personal difficulties that you ran into? Well, it, it liter- in order to shoot outside of my body... At that time, and things have changed slightly since then, but Minecraft is still a memory hog, and so it poses a lot of problems. I literally had to shoot with three computers at once. That is how the first episodes of The Arrival happened. I had one computer running the world that I was in. I had one character who was the camera, and I had one character who was the actor. If I wanted to put other actors into the show... I would have had to add more and more computers. If you're shooting a, if you're shooting Halo for Machinima, first of all, you can have four players on one system. Second of all, it's got a built-in theater mode that allows you to do pretty much whatever you want, including record the action, rewind it, go to any point, change your camera, change your field of view, vision, change everything about it, and then reshoot it. Minecraft, it's basically once and done. And if you screw it up, you got to do it again. And I had to, for certain shots, have someone like come in and move the camera for me because I couldn't operate both the actor and the camera at the same time. I think there is at least one shot where I actually do. And every time I watch it, I'm like, oh, that's because I was trying to bump the right key with my <laughs> foot <laughs> while I'm trying to operate the actor. It was you're, a very you're, you're frustrating upper, experience. You were operating with the Minecraft equivalent of a camera, camera obscura. <laughs> yeah, and I the whole time I'm thinking like this shouldn't be this hard. There must be easier ways to do this. Did and, you ever like look into tools, or were there was there anything that you found when you were making the arrival initially that would have made it easier, or were you just kind of shit out of luck? At that time, I. I vlogged a lot about it and talked about it and asked people for any kind of mod. Uh, direction on like camera things and I never got any feedback on that so as far as I know it didn't exist since then there have been a lot of mods that have been released that specifically focus on camera but still not a lot of stuff that would actually help me with what I'm what I wanted to do which I was never really able to do so did you have any idea where you were gonna go with what at the time was the arrival and then became deus ex minecraft when you started making it yes and the clearest expression of that is through my friend's chris's portrayal of the crimson knight in interrobang you may have the gift okay well what is what does that mean what happened to this princess of yours she has been taken prisoner held against her will she sends out the cross to the one who can help her who can free her. That must be you. Um, that sounds like an awful lot of responsibility that I didn't ask for. I had this idea that in Minecraft, you're alone. I thought it would be interesting if there was a whole backstory to why you're alone. And maybe that story has to do with some kind of Tower of Babel-like idea where at one point, all of the Minecrafters were together in one place and then something happened some lucifer some character you know interferes and decides like this can't happen this needs to this process must be broken and then for whatever reason it all falls apart and everyone gets spun into their own existence and so 
when you see the the black operator character in the arrival and he's reporting to someone who sounds like they're speaking parcel tongue because I just didn't know what else to do. <laughs> it it's kind of like the idea that uh the the char- the primary character, the Sean Martin character is stumbling upon something having to do with this and they want to shut it down because they don't want it to happen. They don't want it to go back to the way it was. The human is not dead, my lord. I'm sorry, I overestimated his intelligence. As you began building out Deus Ex Minecraft as kind of a brand, you call the arrival and the various other elements of it different chapters. Uh, as a as as an author or as a creator, do you consider the arrival finished? No, definitely not. Because that whole idea, which would eventually have led to the princess, because that really that idea was from the very beginning. There was a character called the princess, and perhaps she was in charge of this whole world that everyone coexisted and everyone was happy and whatever. That whole idea that obviously that never happened. The, the there was no mention of the princess. I didn't even get that far. The princess is barely mentioned in Nams, and then in in Interrobang, the princess is mentioned briefly as that idea, but then comes something completely different. My own actual child in real life. Right. Well, let, let me um, let, let me maybe describe it this way. Uh, Evil Dead and Evil Dead Two are in some ways uh, a you know, a movie and a sequel, but in some ways it's the same a slightly story. different telling. Do you think that as you move through the chapters, you've abandoned these old works and kind of grown through them, or are they still things that you would like to one day come back to? No, there. I would not go back to them. I, I think they were stories of their time, and I don't think they can be completed because feel, I'm not feel, the same person. Do you feel? Do you feel bad that you weren't able to complete them, or? I of... regret that the arrival didn't get to go anywhere else, but I, like I said, I'm not the same person. I can't. I there, I could not finish that story now. I might have been able to finish it then, given the time and resources, but it it'll never get finished. So one thing before we move on to um, to not another Minecraft series, one thing that I noticed. So I, I went back and I watched most of the work of Deus Ex Minecraft before we recorded and the arrival is and you've touched on this already as well it's 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 way more cinematic feeling than yeah. the rest of what you did uh was was it intentional that you dropped that was it just too hard to to do what you were doing as you've described it or did you um did you want to go to that kind of first person way of telling stories there no i did not want to have to do that i really really did not want to do that it was too, just it was too hard it is the weightiness of the application itself it is the difficulty in working with the mods it is my own <laughs> inability to understand how to operate with minecraft to to make it do what i want it to do it's it's just too much of a battle and i it was more important to me to be able to tell the story than it was for me to be able to tell it the way that i wanted to tell it why do you why do you think that you had to tell the story in minecraft because as we to, you know in the end of interrobang the story ends in in real life so why why did you want to tell it in minecraft because i didn't know how to use gary's mod <laughs> Seriously? Well, yeah, because it was, it's it's Legos. It's mm-hmm. it's a world that is infinitely customizable, and I could really kind of I knew that the only barriers working against me were the technical aspects of it, but the actual construction and the actual exploration of the landscape and everything, I knew I knew would work towards the story that I wanted to tell. Obviously, you didn't finish the arrival. <laughs> I think about. 18 months later, you reopened Deus Ex Minecraft with not another Minecraft series uh, that you posted on your gaming channel. And I know that you detailed why you put it on your gaming channel. You were in the process of having another sort of uh, a live action, quote unquote, Minecraft series on your primary channel. So you put this on your gaming channel. Um, What brought you back to Deus Ex Minecraft? Well, um, and this is something I've never admitted, and now I will tell the truth. 
I did not mean to bring back Deus Ex Minecraft. I just wanted to make a Minecraft series called Not Another Minecraft Series. Why did you want to make a, a Minecraft series? Because, because you were already you already had one that was fairly popular on your primary channel. I time. wanted something without all of the pressure involved with Survivor Die. That was the show that I was putting on my main channel, and it was a hardcore Minecraft series, and I that meant that I could not die. Right. And when I started making NAMs, if you watch the first two episodes, much like in Terror Bang, but th- that time it was on purpose. I, there's no mention or illusion or anything having to do with Deus Ex Minecraft at all. Yes. And it was only after all of the comments that started coming in that I was that everyone was disappointed for some reason. It, like, I wanted to just have fun playing Minecraft again, period. I just wanted to record myself playing Minecraft. A lot of it is uh, non-vocal because I'm literally just playing the game. I was just trying to capture moments in the game where I was having fun. And a lot of that doesn't have to do with talking about it. Because how many people, except Let's Players, talk the whole time that they're playing the game? They probably just play it and react to certain things, like catching a fish or trying to uh, get a cat to come to you or whatever. And it was after all these comments started coming in that I was like, "Uh, screw all these people. I'm going to prove them all wrong that this series is going nowhere. And I'm bringing back Deus Ex Minecraft. And... That was just the beginning of a huge can of worms that I had no idea what I was about to do. Now what? Uh, what the? No, wait, what's going on? Why is it fading? Ugh. What? Oh my god. It was just a nightmare. (sighs) Thank goodness, because that was weird and freaky and... What the fuck? So essentially you just turned it into a big troll. Yes. That is very interesting. Uh, when you describe your initial your initial impetus as wanting to just do a Minecraft series, uh, I think of your Minecraft series called "This Is a Minecraft Series." Yes. Uh, was that more what you wanted to do? Yes. Which was just kind of like uh, that. That wouldn't necessarily be the same map from time to time, and it, it wasn't. Uh, there were some custom maps. There were some just vanilla play. There was like. That was what NAMS was originally supposed to be. It was just me playing Minecraft for fun. And, uh, and, and letting it, you in on the process. It makes a lot more sense why you would put that on a gaming channel then. Yes. Because you wouldn't have thought of it as kind of like a a SVM production. Right. Uh, but then apparently... Well, then it obviously became an SVM production, and boy, did it become quite a production. Uh, what kind of work went in to the minecraftiness of nams because you have many different worlds that you're in and you had to build a lot of things i'm assuming you integrated different maps uh how how much effort went into like actually constructing what you did in nams i think um i just kind of i threw the rules out that i had originally made for the arrival and i was just like i just want to see what i can do here And I just started making multiple versions of different worlds just so I made sure I had a backup if I needed it. And then I just started doing whatever I wanted to do. I just started using World Edit to code entire landscapes red. I started um, using the editing software to make it appear as if I'm going through multiple worlds. I started uh, putting in uh, effects that are not actually in the game. Like uh, at one point, my character has like double and triple vision and sounds are are all strange and Mm -hmm. things are happening to the character that are almost like hallucinatory. Maybe just a few more and then I'm getting out of here. Whoa. What? What in the... Ah, Frank. Were you the one skip? Oh my God. How many... Whoa, 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 whoa. Get back, get back, get back, get back, get back. God. Ah, okay. Fuck. Oh, another one? Jeez. Ugh, I only have so many swings left on my sword. I just, I was just trying to toy with everything that I could think of. I was kind of throwing everything at the wall, whether or not it stuck. I think we, I think we, I know the answer to this question. You might have already said it in, in 
one way or another. What made you want to brand that? It sounds kind of just sort of like experimental Minecraft machinima. What 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 made you want to brand it Deus Ex Minecraft? Was it the whole trolley aspect of it that you wanted to kind of say like, oh no, it's all part of this thing? Or was there some other reason why you wanted to have it under the same kind of brand? It's because I wanted to finish that story. Because I, I still had all these ideas and that was it was in Nams where I finally got the name of the princess out, and then um, that was also when I started really uh, working with the audience in a way that I had kind of learned from Marble Hornets, where I'm burying messages and I'm putting up secret videos that you can only find if you know what to look for, and you start like finding the links and everything. And that level of interaction made me really like sprint towards this goal of unveiling the true story of the cross or whatever the princess was. You mentioned Marble Hornets. Uh, that that seems like a pretty clear influence on Nams. To what degree were you inspired by Marble Hornets or any other sorts of uh, sources for um, your production there? Um, I There were definitely ideas that I borrowed, um, techniques that I borrowed, Marble Hornets was something that you and I were talking about almost every week, anytime that they would right. feed us a little morsel of someone running through the woods with a camera. And <laughs> They're still I, doing that. Yes, they are. I, I saw what kind of community they had because of that. And I was jealous and I was interested in having something like that for myself. What, what about the audience interaction? Um, what, what did you get? At, so I think the audience can myself included can say what we got out of the production of NAMS, but what did you get out of uh, your interaction with the audience? Well, I think um, a couple months ago, you sent me an article by the guy who does the song a day. What's his name? Jonathan Mann. Jonathan Mann. And it was about specifically his interaction with one person, one viewer. He comments on every video and sometimes it's just like, this song should be on the radio. And he says that like every time. Yeah. And how much of an effect that one person out of thousands of people who watch his videos, how much of an effect that had on him. And that is exactly what it, it's like with every person, including you. I mean, you were a viewer who became a collaborator, but you're not even the only one. There are tons of people who have collaborated with me on all kinds of stuff. People who I haven't even spoken to who... Like, I'm thinking of uh, J.S. King Boo. That's the only name I know him by. But he has supplied me with texture pack updates for every fucking update of Minecraft, whether I want it or not. He's still emailing me texture pack updates because he wants to keep the SVM faithful pack that I made for Survivor Die alive. And that's, that is so cool to have these friends out in the out on the internet in places unknown that are part of your regular life that you don't, maybe I don't know his name, but I, when I see JS King Boo, I know exactly who that guy is and all of the history that we have together and being able to interact with them in the way that I did in NAMS was my kind of reward to them for being fans of mine. I wanted to give them something extra to be able to do other than just sit in front of a computer and watch my video. If, uh, you know, a, a genie in a bottle came out and uh, you had the ability to trade the community that you had built up around SVM and Minecraft for the kind of success that you wanted to originally have and you became a popular Minecraft YouTuber like Chimney Swift or Pulsars Jr. or someone like that back in 2011 or 2012, do you think you would now, knowing where you came, do you think that you would have ta taken that deal? <laughs> no. No, of course not. I, no. <laughs> um, part of it is the cynic in me, but I... Because you, it would have changed your financial situation. Yes, but <laughs> money can't buy you a lot of the things that make you happy. Um, I am currently right now in my personal life the happiest that I have probably ever been. And three years ago, I would have said the same thing. But on this side of it, it's easy to look back and be like, I was miserable. 
I didn't know what was going on. I didn't even have any concept of where my life was about to go. And I look at those people who have found, quote unquote, success on YouTube, and I don't buy it. I don't think that a lot of that is very rewarding. And there's there are ways to be successful in the public eye that I think are probably perfectly fine. Jeff Bridges seems like an awesome dude and he, you know, like lives in Montana or whatever. And he's, he's really happy. But then you look at, uh, Justin Bieber, he's got all the money and all the chicks and whatever, but he's going to look back on this time of his life. If he's not dead in 10 years and be like, what was I doing? And I don't want to pick and choose which YouTubers I'm talking about because I don't want to make anyone mad. Justin Bieber is an easy example. But there are YouTubers who are going to look back at where they are right now, vlogging every day, talking about this and this product and ignoring all their commenters. And they're going to be like, I was a jerk. Why was I doing that? Why was I cultivating that kind of following and just being an asshole to everyone? I think there's also some element of it's it's not fun work what what you have to do to yes. maintain an audience and grow an audience uh, and I, I think that not not to not to speak for you but any time you your product has sort of becomes any time that it sort of felt like work you clearly get disinterested in in it and it almost it always like a month later you come out with something that's way better that you're clearly like interested in. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and part of that is whatever amount of ADD that I have. And part of that is, um, the minutia of this is not my job. Right. I don't want it to feel like a job. And I covered that in my professor Martin's YouTube school. I was like, if you want to make videos that are successful on your own terms, you have to do it when you're having fun. You can't treat it like work or it, it just won't be rewarding for anyone. So does the names folder also have abandoned on it? Uh, it doesn't, but it could because I kind of ran out of steam. I suddenly realized I was in way over my head and it was right about that time that my personal life kind of blew up. And I was just like, I can't deal with all of this. This is never a good sign. This is never good. I don't like this. What in the world? Why is this happening? What was that? What the fuck? Ah! So you took another break between uh, NAMS and then your your final Deus Ex Minecraft product. What inspired you to start making videos again? Because it wasn't just Minecraft videos that you started with in Terrabang, but you hadn't posted a video other than a couple, uh, like... Travelogs. Travelog things. Uh, you hadn't posted a video in, I, I think, something like eight months? I Almost uh, a year. Almost a year. You hadn't posted any video. So what, what, what brought you back to not just Minecraft Machinima, but just YouTube? Well, uh, when I started making videos, it was for fun. And then eventually it became... This, this is almost... This mirrors a pattern of drug use. <laughs> it started for fun. And then it became for distraction. And it got me in a really bad cycle because I was trying to ignore my personal life by making fun videos. And it worked for a very long time. And then when the personal life got so bad, I needed to drop the videos. And I did. And then once my personal life turned around, everything became better. I found stability again. I was able to tell myself, now I can make videos just for fun again. And that's what I did. Was your was your idea to do a Minecraft machinima or just to do some kind of video? Because your original videos, your larger work on YouTube that I don't think most people know about was all live action edited five things videos. Right, right. 
So w w did you just want to do anything, or did you know that it was going to be Minecraft? I wanted to do anything, and the reason I chose something that was not my face looking in a camera is because I needed to get my I, I needed to get my groove back. Mm -hmm. I needed to transition back into what I used to do, and the easiest way to do that, I felt, was to finish Deus Ex Minecraft. <laughs> So before we talk about uh, Interrobang, do you want to talk about scoring Interrobang? Yeah, sure. So why do you score your videos? It's something that I I feel like I kind of wanted to do all along. And if you if you watch the arrival, there's a moderate amount of scoring there that I did I did all of that work myself. Um, if I knew how to use the tools that I have available to me as far as music goes better, I would have scored in Terrabang with all original pieces. As it is, I used uh, a website to find loops that various people, just internet people make and put up for anyone's use. They're just like, use this, use this loop if you want, give me credit if you want, send me a link if you want. If not, no worries. And it's just, it's kind of like that kind of community. It's just like, hey, I made this thing. And if you want to use it, it's fine. And when I stumbled upon that, I was like, this is amazing. It was like I, I found the ultimate library of all the ideas that were probably already bouncing around in my head, but I didn't have to actually go through the effort of making them. <laughs> and then basically I would have made my own music the same way. I just, I found pieces that I liked. And then I started pulling them apart and putting them back together. And the theme song of, of Interrobang, it's three different beats, beats and loops by three different people compiled by me. So it's got four different artists who weren't even trying to collaborate mashed together to make a theme song that if you've watched the series, I, I feel like that theme song evokes something in you. Like every time you hear it, when the when the title card drops and the theme song starts or when you're getting to the end of the episode and you start hearing the theme song like creep up underneath the dialogue or whatever like it just gives you this feeling and as soon as i realized that i was like i need to score so many more moments of the show because of the feeling that it creates yeah i mean like i think that the theme song for interrobang has a sort of an svmness all of its own like you can't like you can't leave that you have to take that with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, the did, did you know where you were going? Did you know where you were going to end? The journey that your character takes and meeting Elaine and the sort of fuzziness between these worlds. Did you know you were going there? Yes. Okay. I had every intention of doing all of that. So did you know you were going to end with having a baby? <laughs> no. I mean, I already knew it was happening when I started, but I didn't realize that that was going to become the culmination of the project. When did you realize that your Minecraft machinima had become autobiography? Um, I, I, there's, I, I can put a date on it because it's, I put up a vlog where I talked about it. Um, but it was, it was a moment where I realized like the people that I wanted involved in the project were the same people who have been intimately involved in my YouTube process. And that's you, uh, Ron, Elaine, and Chris. It was at that moment that I was like, I didn't want these people to be involved just because I wanted them to be involved. I wanted them to be involved because it's part of everything that got me to where I am that those people were even there to be asked in the first place. When did you start scheduling people to be, or when did you when did you start the idea of integrating uh, your friends and YouTube colleagues into Interrobang? Did you know right at the beginning you were going to do that, or did you decide at some point that you wanted to do that? I sent out the first episode in an email before it had been publicly aired to, to you and that group of people, mm -hmm. and um, I wanted immediate feedback. Um, the first episode also did not have any hint about 
uh, Deus Ex Minecraft, so I wanted feedback without the weight of that hanging over it, even though I knew that that was going to happen. And then when I did put up the trailer for the for the series, there was a hint in there. So everyone in the in the public who was already aware of the red and everything was like, oh. Um, so when I put out that initial thing, it was for general feedback and also like, are you interested in being a part of this? And everyone who's in it responded positively and uh, I found a way to work everyone in and then as I went along I kind of figured out why they were involved in the way that they were like uh, Ron for instance appears as a very strange character which was his idea and then after it happened I kind of decided that the reason that he was that way had to do with what was actually happening, which was the character that you're seeing the perspective of is something bouncing around in my computer. And perhaps Ron's shadow character is some remnant of Ron left over on my hard drive. Mm. Like kind of like a a Tron-esque idea of, you know, there are characters and fractures, like a fraction of a character left. And that's what Ron's character was. How's it going with that vents? Working out okay? All good? Good? Do you know that word? Good. 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 Elaine's character was similar, but more, much more fully realized. You're scared of the dark, eh? Well, yeah, it's dangerous. <laughs> it is. It's dangerous to go out at night. You ask questions at the weirdest things. Like, you're making me wonder if I'm normal. But I am i know that I'm normal. Why aren't you scared of the dark? I don't know. I just... It's kind of fun. I got my friend Frank out there, and I gotta... Yeah, sometimes I gotta, you know, like, knock him down. But he always comes back, and he wants to give me hugs. Chris's character was a fictional character that never existed because I never got to that part of the story in The Arrival. And your character was you in real life right? as the world started to blend and we started to realize that what was happening in the computer and what was happening in the real world were the same thing. Have you been like, have you been, have you been like not getting some sleep or something? You feeling okay, dude? I feel fine. I don't know how I got to be here though. I can't move in this space. Is this like, is, is this like some sort of new, uh, like technique for a warm up for the podcast or something? Like, what are you doing, man? Are you done with Deus Ex Minecraft? <laughs> As of March 16th, 2014, I'm saying that I'm done. Okay. But I've also said that before. Sure. So, as a creator, you're done with it. Do you feel that the story is complete? Yes. Which is and why, which is, that's there's why else I'm, that you want to, to address. Yes. My, all of my original ideas, I felt like not only did I explain them all by having Chris do Captain Exposition over there, but I also felt like they were somewhat, uh, they weren't fully realized. They were bad writing. They were juvenile, like any, any number of things that I would not revisit them. Like, it's just it just wasn't a great story. It was a, it was maybe a kernel of a good idea, but what I actually came up with eventually was so much better that I that I would never consider going back and telling any of that as if it were actually true. So you've had a a, a fairly dedicated viewership uh, over the years that you've been on YouTube, um, and I think that they've followed you through a lot of kind of crazy twists and turns in your YouTube career. But in Tarot Bang is almost like a PhD course in uh, crazy YouTube directions that you led some people on. Do, uh, do, do you regret in any way not making the series more accessible? I mean, you reference Survivor Die, you reference all of your old Deus Ex Minecraft videos, you make references to so many things and... Uh, do you, do you do you did you ever feel bad about making it kind of a a one percent production? No, because that was what it was about. It was about rewarding all those people who followed me all this way 
And if you're just tuning in and you're interested, cool. If you're just tuning in and you're totally lost and you don't care, well then bye. I'm sorry that this is not for you. But if you've been watching all this time, you're going to understand all of these links and it's going to be really rewarding for you. And you're probably going to feel, and this is the reason I did it, like it was made for you. So how does it feel to have finished it? It feels like a huge relief. And it actually began, the relief started as soon as I sat down one night and wrote the 10 page finale, which became 17, 18 and 19. I just, there was one night that I, I I don't know if it was a full moon or something, something just felt right. And I was like, this is the night that I end the story. And I just sat down with my notepad and I wrote the end of the story. It is sitting right here and writing it down felt so good. And when I hit the end and I hit all the, the points with the princess and then I wrote, you know, fade in on my daughter's room i was like this is so good (laughs) i was like this is gonna hit so many buttons with so many people and that's what i want it to feel like and i wrote (laughs) black at the end because you know it cuts to black and i was like project done i feel so awesome even though i hadn't filmed any of what i'd just written i just i felt an instant sense of relief that I had written something that I really felt would reward all those people who have been holding on for whatever the story was, wherever it was headed. Did you feel more relief for yourself or for those viewers? For myself, I guess. But you still had all of those people's, uh, you had them in mind, that you had strung along people for, um, some people for almost three years, so surely they were also in your mind that you wanted to to, to give them some, some payoff. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel like, so you feel relief. Do you feel uh, that the payoff was was good enough for the viewers? I sure hope so, because I think I don't, I don't, I try not to talk about it too much, but basically my life now, even though she's not here yet, is my daughter's. Like everything about what I'm doing now in my personal life has become about my daughter and I don't want to overwhelm everyone with that but I wanted to make it very clear that that's what this was all about and that's where my YouTube career has headed and that's where my personal life has headed and the importance that it has for me I hope translates to a a good ending to the story for you This podcast, Broke the Internet, is a production of five things. If you have comments or feedback, you can find us on Twitter at PodcastBroke or use the hashtag PodcastBroke. This episode was brought to you by the Knights of the Crimson Cross. Thanks for listening. I'm Carter, and this podcast broke the internet. I'm Sean, and this week, this podcast broke the internet, is breaking the internet. So this week, we're taking a look back, a retrospective, a clip show. I was at a a diner this morning, and there was totally a friend's clip show on, and there was no closed captioning on, and I was still dying. Because I was like, oh, that's the scene where, and oh, that's the one where, and Freud... Like, that whole thing. Uh, so do you think we've earned a look back? I think it will only help us to mm. become better. Mm. I think that's why we're doing it. I think that's true. I worry a little, though, because it's like, eh, are we, like, being a little navel gazy, whatever? But, you know, I'm we're doing it. We're um, do- if... In terror, if I could get away with Interrobang without being called self-indulgent by all of the people who like my stuff, I think we're okay. We'll see if we can get away with you doing Interrobang and then us doing an interview about you, <laughs> Interrobang, and then us doing a retrospective of the interview of you doing Interrobang. <laughs> so, Sean, we got some interesting feedback from Elaine, and while we were el- we were intending to do 
some kind of look back. I think that her question was well timed and is uh, is a really good question. Do you wanna do you wanna give her feedback? What she, what she sent to us? Yeah, Elaine uh, caught up on our episodes and had some very nice things to say. She's enjoyed the the new podcast. She said she definitely hears the difference between the format of Sean and Carter have a podcast and this new one. And she said, why do you podcast? And then my head exploded. Right. And then I took, so hear that, hear this guys, this is, this is like 10 pages of notes, the crazy notes that I was trying to put together what this podcast was going to be about. And then Elaine just fixed it for, for us with like one simple question. So thank you, Elaine. Carter's over there like Doc Brown pulling his hair out and yelling gigawatts. Great Scott! <laughs> So my immediate reaction is to say, I don't know, because I think whenever anyone asks you a question like that, like, you don't, don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Why do you complicated. Know anything? Why is the sky blue? Refraction and whatever. This podcast doesn't exist because of light refracting. Um, but it is complicated. And actually, one thing I just thought of is this is not the first time that we've podcasted. Correct. I think, I think people who are avid followers of you... I'm here, I'm sort of here for the ride. They, you know, d- devotees know that we recorded like 80 podcasts a long time ago. It wasn't that long ago. It started in 2011. There you go. So it, it's 2014 now. <laughs> so it was kind of a long time ago. And we recorded a lot of them. And actually, ju- as we were collecting our thoughts and honestly recording the podcast before we hit the record button and then we had to shut ourselves up we we both kind of uh admitted that the previous podcast that we recorded we kind of were burnt out on there came that day on the weekend or whenever we went to record it that i was like oh this is the day that i have to talk for three hours and when it started for me it was this is the day i get to talk for three hours right and it be (laughs) and then it became this is the day i have to talk for three hours and um, this reminds me a little bit of feedback that Ron gave us, which I think he might have he might have thought that I was being negative, which I wasn't at all uh, on, on YouTube. That he didn't I, he didn't realize that there was a format to Sean and Carter have a podcast, or that there's a format to or uh, like that there's a format to this podcast, and there is. <laughs> uh, and one of the things about the format of this podcast is it's really just the simple idea of you know sharing something, and I would say that it's become kind of like this American life. We, we, we pick a theme each week and we share two things on that theme. Yep. Uh, Sean and Carter have a podcast had a crazy format. Like, it was burdensome by the end. It was, it, it like, was almost like we worked the format to be whatever it is that we wanted to talk about. Yeah. Not the other way around. Yeah. The Sean and Carter have a podcast became work and then I got busy. Sean got busy. Life happened. And then we kind of stopped recording a podcast and then we started again. And I think that's where like Elaine's question kind of comes up. Because we didn't have to do a podcast. Uh, we were done. I, I was satisfied with our original run of podcasts. And we, we both kind of mutually agreed that, yeah, let's do this podcast thing again. Why, why, why did we do it? Do you, do you even know? I well, don't even know. Uh, I definitely look forward to... I'm going to get all misty-eyed here. I look forward to our time together every week, <laughs> Carter. I know. I know. Me Cause, too. Because uh, Carter and I don't live within reasonable distance of each other. Pretty close. We have, we've seen each other in person before. But it's not like we could like you know go around the corner to the, the pub or something. Like right. This time that you get to share with us is the only time that we really get to talk. Yeah. It's a valuable experience to me, and I'm glad that we've turned it into a constructive whatever that we can share with all of you, and it becomes part of uh, history, essentially. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. So I make I do make time to talk to like my friends, but I'm I'm pretty bad about it. I'm notoriously notoriously bad about keeping keeping, you know, get-togethers, social things. I cancel stuff all the time. I, I, I don't think that's just you. I, I think that's being an adult yeah. in, in America. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, are, so I, many things to do. What a first-world problem to have. 
Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um. So there's this comedian who I'm actually blank. John Mulaney. So he 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 introduces one of his uh, stand-up albums with you know, hey, thank you all for coming here, uh, and it's it's really great that you all uh, did something because it's so nice to not do something. It's so and it's so easy too. And it isn't it great to not do something that you have to do <laughs> to just cancel it totally. Yeah. I totally yeah I totally feel that way about a lot of stuff, but I. I I don't think I mean we've we've skipped a couple like a couple recording dates for this podcast but we have been like diligent about it even you know kind of surprisingly diligent I'm like oh no I've I tell people I'm like no I can't do anything on Sunday between like these hours because I'm going to be doing something and yes Sean I like you very much but I think that the whole the fact that it's a podcast and that we're putting it out there publicly and I want it to be good kind of forces me to do it so there's like a lot of stuff there it's like yeah this is like a nice time to talk to each other but we also have to like kind of work a little i think one of the differences between the last podcast and this one is this one maybe it's because it has this format that we've worked on but it feels like a moving train Mm. and i don't want to fall behind on the tracks i want to stay on the train and SCHP, it was kind of like, if we really had to skip a week, we just did. And it's like, oh, there's no podcast this week. I'm sorry. <laughs> and this one, we haven't missed a week, mostly because we're ahead. And yeah. we continue to plan to stay ahead so that that never happens. At least yeah. until the whenever the demise of whatever this is is. Yeah. Well, when this starts feeling like work, I think we can probably agree ahead of time. When this starts feeling like work, we will end it. It won't go on like SCHP did. We will say this was a project that we feel like has kind of come and run its course, and we're gonna we'll do one last episode, and then it'll be done. But I don't feel like I say this now, but I don't feel like, I don't see that even in the distance. No, at it, this point, it, uh, it'll end or evolve. Right. It's and it's the the format has so SCHP was over formatized. It was too much. It was way too much, and it it became kind of uh, it, like a prison that you ha- we we have to do this follow up. We have to do Captain Science. We have to do a tech topic. We have to do an entertainment topic. And this, I texted Sean last night. I just had this. Cr- <laughs> I was watching. Um, I don't even remember what I was watching, and I just had this crazy idea. Like, oh, you know what? We should do something on roller coasters. And it's like I. When we began this project, you know, in December, I would not have thought roller coasters would be a topic <laughs> at all. And now it's like, yeah, we could, yeah, we can make that work. We can do roller coasters somehow. Yeah, there was, was there any? Has I texted you back in like thirty seconds? I was like, let's do it. Yep, exactly. Yeah, you're like, yep, done. Yep, <laughs> sold. Done. I, I love gonna, roller coasters. I love roller coasters too, right? So, there, that that's an aspect of this is that it's it's really. We just get to talk about things we like, right? Like who wouldn't who wouldn't want to talk about things that they like? And I think um we find ways to relate those things to other things so that anyone listening whether or not they care about such and such app on whatever, they're finding something to cling on to in the passion of our voice or the the way that we share things with each other or whatever. It's just like they listen to us because we're friends. Yeah, well, we listen to each other because we're friends, so it, that helps. If we were, like, enemies, the podcast would probably be much worse. Or better, who knows? Hold on, I'm going to write this down as a future concept idea. Yeah, enemies, enemy, po- enemy, enemy podcasters. podcast, Enemy podcasters. There's something there. There's something there, man. <laughs> yeah, so you brought up apps. That is so much what I want this podcast to be about, is... I've never heard of aviary and you know things that I like. I'm going to check this thing out. Like and and then we're just creating this, you know, this externality, right? This we're just like there's this exhaust. We share things with each other and then there's this exhaust that just pours out that hopefully other people are getting good stuff out of. And I'm pretty sure my friend Ed listened to the, that podcast and got Zeit. I did. Yeah, I got aviary. And hey, guess what? I d- deleted it. <laughs> But I'm glad you, I learned. You take shitty pictures now too. Mm, 
mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, my, I didn't, and it didn't make me want to take photos anymore. I answered that question that I had. <laughs> I, I think I knew the answer. <laughs> but it, I was, it, certain people, it affects certain ways, and I'm, other people, it doesn't. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't. I certainly don't want to bias anyone. Like Aviary is a very handsome map, works really great. I just it didn't. I don't take very good photos. I should do it more. I should do it more. I, and I, I almost feel bad that I've got this phone. The, the The camera on the iPhone 5s is one of the best cameras that you can get on a mobile phone, outside of like that Lumia, crazy, ca- the Nokia phone. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like 50 megapixel. It's it's basically a camera with a phone. They it. they shot the commercials for it on it. Yeah, but this is so this isn't that good. But this is a very good camera. And when I take a good picture, I'm like, ooh, this is really great. Sidebar, isn't it crazy how better the quality on the image and the sound is between the vlogs I did in like 2011 and the vlogs that I'm doing now? Well, I don't know. How could I compare them because I can't see them? Touche. Touche, my friend. Um, I have a... I don't even know what this is. Oh, so I, the, the next photo photo is a, a, an image of my shirt because I pushed the record button, but I hadn't turned it into camera mode. Yep, I do that. Constantly. And then the image before that is a game of... Have you, so have you heard of uh, 2048? Yeah. It's a ripoff of this iOS game called Threes, which I like a lot. But 2048 is actually easier. Threes is on Android, too. Oh, oh, great. Well, hey, everyone, if you want a game that's really cool, get Threes. Uh, like, I also, I was looking at it last night, and I know that it is uh, on sale right now. But that won't matter to the time that this <laughs> podcast is published. Oh, sorry, guys. Well, anyway, uh, my last real image is an image of, uh, I, I took a, a picture of my computer. I was playing 2048. Ugh, it's so sad, John. In the left top corner, I have a 1024 tile. Underneath it, a 512. To the right of it, a 256. And just under that, a 128. And I just blocked myself in. It, I have all the tiles I need for a 2048, which I've never gotten before. <laughs> and I just wanted to... I don't know why I took a picture of it. I'm not going to tweet it. I'm. It's, it's just... It's just a reminder. Just to of, make you sad. Just a reminder of what could have been. <laughs> uh, keep keep trying. Keep trying. Yeah, I've been using Zeit since every day since uh, you recommended it. It has actually kind of replaced a few other things that I used to do on my phone. Oh, really? Like what? I, I don't find myself going to Reddit nearly as much anymore because you're right. A lot of the times, all the stuff that shows up on Reddit, like the important stuff, um, I'm going to find on Zype within mm-hmm. the hour or two that it gets posted. Yeah. And it's such a cleaner way of finding it. Do I really need to read through all of the hundreds of Reddit comments? Probably not. Probably not. And it's in the middle of all the congestion, all of the advice, animal, blah, blah. Right, which, of course, you can unsub to, but it's Zite is so much easier. It is easier. It's way easier. I, I do find that sometimes Zite gets a little dumb and it will do the same article like twice, yeah. but in slightly different formats. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I want a way that I can just push a tile off the screen. That is an interesting idea for mm, just to hide mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Right. A million dollar idea, Zite, but you can push the tiles out. Push the tiles off the screen. I've seen that in another, in a different application. Yeah. And it just seems obvious. Call it tiles. There's something there. Back to what we what we're what we're discussing. Uh, I had this. So this is this has become a little melancholy since we've been talking so much about Sean and Carter of a podcast and um, and like how we didn't like it. But I think it's like important to talk about that because that's how we got here right now. Uh, and then I I had this thought when we were talking about it. Like, why is it easier? And I think that there are lots of reasons why why this is easier. Like the format. But the other thought I had, well, Sean had the thought, and I, I and I had thought of the metaphor, is that we basically built up a podcasting muscle with Sean with SGHP and, and FTP, and we're kind of, you know, good at it or we're better at it. And if we had started this with no muscle, it probably would have fallen on its face. But now we, you know, we we or maybe like riding a bike or something. You know, it's like we have that skill, and now it's easier to do things when you have that skill. It's like learning the learning the piano. You got to do the 
the dumb. You got to do the scales. You got to do the can, muscle memory things. Yeah, you got to learn your scales before you can play jazz. And not only, not only the did we condition the muscle, but when we made SCHP, we had conversations before it started about like what it would be. But most of the learning we did on the ground as we were going. And this podcast, we spent months figuring out kind of what it was. We didn't we didn't let it craft itself. We forced it to be something. Yeah, I, I think my very we had a phone call about long phone call about this in August. We didn't do the first episode until December. That's how long it took. Yeah. Uh, my original thought was that it would it would be more like This American Life, and that we would have like more interviews and stuff. We've, we've done one interview with you, and I want to do more of that. But that I I think that my my original thought is very it's very different from where we got to and then we were going to do the whole tv thing that was the thing we were going to try right we mentioned I, that on the sitcom episode mm-hmm. and i think we had other intervening ideas or just like hey what about this what about that uh yeah it was easier to start at schp i think we just oh, i don't even I, so that i don't even remember i think we just sat down and talked for yeah. a while and also i will spoil this it was easy for well, Sean, you have a history in radio, right? You did college radio. Yeah. So you had some experience there. It was also easy for me to get started because I had at that point been listening to podcasts and I was I was ripping off what a lot of the people who I liked were doing. I hadn't really found my own voice and what I wanted to sound like. So well, that's what you're supposed to do. Exactly. Until right? you learn. Until you learn. So I was like, I'm going to be like John Syracuse or I'm going to be like Dan Benjamin or whoever. Marlon Mann. I'm kind of being like Marlon Mann right now. Anyone who listens to his podcast will, I don't know, whatever. I think we've kind of been skirting around the idea of why we podcast, though. Like, there are personal reasons why we podcast. But beyond the fact that, yes, we like talking with you, with each other and sharing. Uh, because uh, we're attention whores? That's probably part of it, right? It's you gotta, gotta be. Y- you gotta be some kind of narcissist to... I have faced that reality every time I put my camera in front of my face. <laughs> I'm like... I'm I'm doing this all for me. Yes, for me. Ha <laughs> Yeah, right? Uh there is an uh, so I I don't want to I don't want to like totally derail this. The, it is different though from what you do on YouTube because we don't have like a like button and a subscriber count. Yes. You know? There's not the constant like refresh, 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 and I, I, I mean, don't have spo- we don't have sponsorships, we don't have right any any means to ends here. Yes, but there is still the reality that we we could record these podcasts and just put them in our pocket, right? right. <laughs> we don't have to put them on the internet. We don't have to tweet about them with a personalized Twitter account that we created. If it was so, I think that you and I have a sufficient level of of taste. That if we thought this wasn't any good, we wouldn't do it. If we th- if we th- if we didn't think other people would like this, we wouldn't do it in the first place. And I think that's part of what why I do it and why I do it the way I do it. I'm trying to create something that I would listen to or someone like me would listen to. I like listening to the podcast. And for anyone who isn't a content creator, blah, I hate that word. I hate that phrase. Um, for anyone who has doesn't like make stuff, especially stuff where you're communicating, or rather anyone who does that, I I believe every single person who does that, when you watch it back, you cringe a little because you're seeing yourself. Yes. And seeing yourself is totally awkward. So it is. It, so that being said, like I hear myself on the podcast and I cringe, but I still listen to it and I like it. So there's something there. Ha- so there has to be something there. I don't think we I still don't think we fully answered the question though. Do you feel that? No. Why 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 do you podcast? I'd be doing something else if I wasn't podcasting. So I mean something else in the ilk or something completely different. I don't know. I don't know about that. I at the same time we kind of got the pot, uh, the podcast off the ground in December, I had been plan I'm still doing this where I'm seeing lots of movies. Yeah. I had planned to journal that diary it with the intent of potentially turning it into a blog or i you know written something book i don't know ebook uh and i kind of i'm still seeing movies 
but I'm not diring diarying it anymore because and I think the reason why I think I've realized right now why is I already have a place for that kind of creative output to go and it's here but it's like it would go somewhere right maybe you would have made videos or I, I have no idea maybe you start a band I think I went through that kind of when I came back to YouTube and I consciously decided not to do let's plays because mm -hmm. Over the time that I was away from YouTube, most of a year, I was playing a lot more video games than I had while I was on YouTube. Mm. And I was having so much fun playing them. It was like a whole new experience. And when I came back, I was like, well, I guess I could do this Let's Play, or I could boot up The Sims again. or I could... And then I was like, no, that will ruin the fun that I'm having right now. Yeah. And I didn't want to do that. <laughs> you know, the... What seems to be the most common question I see on any video you post ever is, what happened to The Sims? What happened to The Sims? I I'll tell you. So I watched every episode, and I thought it was fine, but it's like, that was not your best work. Why are they so focused on I The Sims? Know. I don't know. Everyone it, really liked that series. Um, there You did another series that was also on that gaming channel that I liked better. I can't, and I, for the life of me, I don't even know what it is anymore. You did a lot of stuff. Um... Yeah, what that they're crazy about that. A lot one. of people liked Gordon Freeman. Oh, Gordon Freeman was really good. That was good. That might be it. No no one's like, what happened to Nams? <laughs> well, that did happen for a while, and then it died down. Mm. No, but that makes sense. So you like made this conscious decision, like, I don't want to do this. It, you almost kind of like got forced into doing a podcast. Because I don't know, do you so you were doing Interrobang and then we did the podcast, now you're doing yesterday's news do you think that you would have had the idea for yesterday's news or like you would have gotten there if you weren't being creative somehow i don't know because would it, it happened like earlier because yeah. there are a lot of things that have gone into the creation of that show already that came from conversations with you or just getting back into the game in general yeah. because there are certain there's like one or two elements in that in the format of the show that i can directly point to night vale and yeah it, how would I would never have come up with those ideas if you hadn't turned me on to Night Vale? Yeah, and I'm not ripping them off. But, yeah, but there's like a chain of thought that you can go backwards until you get to Night Vale, and you're like, yeah, that came from there. Yeah, you know, um, so you got into Night Vale. Uh, my friend Ed got into Night Vale. My friend Dessa got into Night Vale because of because of the podcast, and that's something that I'm like really proud of. I'm like, yeah, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't have done that if not for the podcast. And I told both of them about it before. I'd been like, hey, I'm listening to this podcast. It's really good. I think it's up your alley. You should listen to it. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe. But then hearing it in the podcast, you know, knowing that I took the time to put it here was the thing that made them be like, oh, okay, I should listen to it's this. It's because you pulled an Adam Lisagor and you shared it in a way with care. Mm-hmm. It's it was that was the reason that I made five things. The very first five yeah. things I included two things that were directed at my parents because I was like, I've told you about Netflix so many fucking times and you never listen to me. So Netflix was one of the things on the first episode of Five Things, and no. sure enough, my parents have Netflix now. No Quickster though. <laughs> no Quickster. <laughs> Reed Hastings, damn it. Reed Hastings is really important for us. We wouldn't be here without Reed Hastings. For many reasons. Many reasons. He gave us fodder to talk about news. He gave us the system that we did the a lot of our entertainment stuff in. Frustrated us. Made us happy. Reed Hastings. What a guy. What a guy. That SNL sketch with Jason Sudeikis. I'm sure we talked about that. <laughs> yes, we did. Sure we did. Don't remember what we said, but I'm sure we talked about it. You know, you've talked a lot about how like Five Things was a really tough production. Like It was hard to do. Yeah. Yeah, you had to take like a whole day, and, I, um, and you know I think that some of that the I, I don't think that this is the, I don't think this is the same as Five Things, but I think that a lot of the the same idea that you had the same rationale for Five Things is here now, and will be in yesterday's news, of course. But you know I think you brought a lot of that to this. Whereas Sean and Carter was not that was not what we were doing at all. That was not like Five Things. It was very different, but this is this is much more like what you're doing there. SCHP was a little ranty. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'll admit, I'll admit to that. 
that I wanted to place Durant and to be like my hero, John Syracuse. One of the things when we started this podcast that I laid down a firm commitment was like, I'm not ranting about Apple. I haven't yet mentioned them once, maybe maybe twice. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never gone on like a big thing and I haven't been like, we need to talk about. Does this count as a mention? Because it just happened. I'm still not satisfied with uh, with answering Elaine's question. I don't know. I don't know that you can be totally satisfied with that, though. That was a tough question. Elaine's a good interviewer. It's like asking, what is the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? 42. 42. <laughs> This podcast, Broke the Internet, is a production of five things. If you have comments or feedback, you can find us on Twitter at PodcastBroke or use the hashtag PodcastBroke. This episode is also available on Quickster. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.